health and fitness coach, Tian Clark. So DECA only cycles. What is this DECA only situation? The DECA only cycle. Um, I'm also known for is getting people's appetite actually to an amazing level better than it's ever been before while also eating healthy. What did you do with uh, Jim Roberts? Every few weeks, about every three to four weeks, it would jack right up to 300 to 400. Bam, they literally have to restart his heart. Jesus Christ. There is a compound that I semi-recently discovered. It's a steroid. It is actually one of the safest ones. That steroid is actually It would be nice if Derek takes a look at this. I'm gonna start trialing this out. The only studies you have on receptor content, which we know is the be all end all of your game, it's not your serum levels, increases, then it turns literally to baseline in six weeks. <laughs> I see why people hate you for this. <laughs> well, uh, that, you- <laughs> What's your cycle right now, if you don't mind me asking, or what are you doing right now? Okay, I'll explain that one in a minute. What's up, guys? I just wanted to give this little disclaimer before the podcast starts, but basically, ideating steroids for a full podcast discounts a lot of the hard work that is required for this sport and gives the idea that a chemical solution is all you need for results, when that isn't true. You know, bodybuilding is a difficult and rigorous and not very safe sport, and in doing so, a lot of us can cause a lot of harm to our health. So the purpose of this podcast and what I would like the goal of this entire podcast, not just this episode, but this podcast as a whole be, is to openly and transparently talk about PD use and what people do and ways that we can improve our health markers, ways that we can reduce the harm rather than to promote drugs. Promoting drugs is the last thing I'd like to do, but knowing that a lot of people will take things like this regardless, I would like to step into the space where I openly talk transparently about things that people do not agree on and that people don't want to talk much about in the hopes that maybe it could help someone. So here's the podcast. What's up, homies? So after my pod with James English, I received a big influx of requests to have this coach on. And uh, Tyan and I actually, that, that's how you pronounce it, right? Yeah, yeah. Tyan. Yeah. Um, Tyan and I actually wanted to do it in person, but unfortunately, with some complications relating to Canada, we did have to keep it over call, which personally is a little frustrating sometimes because uh, the delay from the call makes it a little difficult to flow conversation properly. But honestly, I'm just thankful to be able to do the podcast with you, man. Hey, yeah, uh, thanks for having me on. I know... Um everybody was spamming you and then they're spamming me like now nah, i'll have him on and they're like go check out Niall's new video so <laughs> that's funny that's great dude i feel like there's really not there's not that many people that uh openly talk about ped use or anything and there's so many bodybuilders everywhere but people just don't do it so i think that's that's why um you know it's easy to like latch on to like creators like you and vigorous steve so i think you guys do a lot of uh, great things for the community yeah it's definitely catching on a little more um popular right people being fully completely uh transparent with everything right i mean i'm all for it personally just since uh you know you never really want to take a shot with the dark of the dark at in, in, in something that's just so detrimental to your health and people are going to do it anyways right like same thing with the fentanyl crisis um people are going to do recreational drugs regardless you can't just tell everybody to stop doing drugs so i mean at least letting them know the, you know the awareness of fentanyl in the substances and just how uh like stringent it is and how uh how much more like available that fentanyl is in ugl drugs honestly i just think it's something to at least talk about yeah absolutely um well especially with your name here hey eh? transparent everybody gets a kick out of that like i i only seen your <laughs> channel um a couple months ago and somebody uh somebody linked it and it was like yeah that's a good name. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> nice. Thanks, bro. I appreciate that. Honestly, I get a little self-conscious about it because I don't want to be, uh, you know, there's people that'll just get the bat the wrong idea from seeing the name but not watching the content. And most people don't really take the time to watch the content. But uh, I like the name, so I'm keeping it. <laughs> but anyways, I just wanted to say that I, uh, I really actually truly appreciate your work, man. Like, you clearly truly care about your client's health and you discover ways to greatly reduce both the trivial and the serious side effects. So um, honestly, in fact, it kind of appears to be your highest priority. And that's something that I really aim to stand by with this podcast. Yeah, that's a hundred percent. 
if you've seen, like I was saying, you check out some more of my uh, testimonials. Um, 100% health is the uh, biggest focus for me, whether it's um, not not just PED use either, you know what I mean? Diet, overall health, like that is that is the biggest focus of mine um, in every single aspect. Mm-hmm. I also hold respect that you're a father, man. I didn't even know that until we started talking. Oh, yeah, because, yeah, I don't post almost uh, – anything uh related to that it, i'm sure you notice like my whole personal life is like completely 100 percent uh private in a sense i i posted like a picture too yeah actually I, I do have like one um video up on my instagram but uh yeah so i normally keep that uh uh private ish you know what i mean mm-hmm. yeah i mean regardless though like so much respect because that's that is my highest goal in seeing bodybuilders like you and Eric Janicki work and manage time and responsibility with your kids, in my opinion, is is pretty amazing and something that I uh, truly admire. Yeah, I, I never wanted kids or, uh, originally. Like, it wasn't, you know, I feel like most people who are into the fitness community, like, kids are, like, the last thing on their, um, on their list, kind of, you know what I mean? But then, you know how everybody says the same thing. It's, you know, oh, once you have kids, it changes your life, and it's a million percent, like, I went from enjoying my selfishness essentially to the second I had a kid, it's like, no, like every single thing I do is like orientated towards giving him the best life. Basically. Like it, it literally is just like, you may have felt like you had a purpose before doing, I don't know, whatever is your passion. But as soon as you have a kid, it's like, bam, like, no, like that is your passion. You feel like that's your purpose. It's, it's actually is life changing. It's true. What they say. Yeah. That's something I've been thinking about a lot recently because it's, from my knowledge, it's not something that we think about until it happens, right? But for some reason, my mind is recently, I don't know what it is in the last couple of years, but a family is like the biggest thing I've been thinking about. I just kind of chatted Tristan Lee's ear off in our last podcast about this, but I'm just thinking like all the things that we have to do now, my biggest priority is like, I want to be able to make sure that I can provide for my partner and my kid or kids without the assumption that my partner's gonna have an income too. And honestly, living in LA, that stresses the shit out of me. Yeah. So, yeah, no, much respect, man. Yeah, it is definitely, um, it, I feel like, it, how old are you? I am, it's a secret, because uh, <laughs> they have my uh, age wrong on Google, okay, so okay. I like to keep it like that. Uh, yeah, it's definitely- uh, I, Late 20s. Okay, yeah, I was gonna say, I, I feel for sure you are definitely younger than me, and I was gonna be like, yeah, I, I wish I had them sooner. And then like you said, kids that's what i want now too i want like 10 20 like it's it actually oh, that's awesome yeah oh shit that's crazy from zero to like 20 like absolutely like <laughs> it's funny damn well anyways first before um you know that we know that deca only is like i'd say what you're most known for uh, i do want to discuss that but before that i actually want to ask you what did you do with uh jim roberts it seems like this guy had a lot of hard cop complications since being a teenager and through working together in your coaching you guys fixed that can you talk a little bit about it yeah 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 um so jim um he had a a sinus rhythm arrhythmia like his um the heart um the heartbeat was off right so uh, sorry his sinus rhythm so his heart would literally um so for most of the month he'd be somewhere between like 100 to 200 heart rate then um Every few weeks, about every three to four weeks, it would jack right up to 300 to 400. So he'd literally have to go to the emergency room and he'd have to get his heart restarted, the defibrillator. Bam, they'd literally have to restart his heart. And the doctors were saying, you know, you'll be lucky to live um, to see uh, your daughter, your kids, whatever, grow up. Um, And as soon as he came to me, I was like, okay, just from all my knowledge and research about so many different, I just research anything and everything. And instantly I was like, okay. I fixed a few different heart issues before and I was like, okay, we know what controls the heartbeat. It's your electrolytes. Um, literally within a, it was about a week. He's basically 90% normal. And then by um, another week or two, bam, his heart rate was fully normal. And this was like a year or two ago now, I think. And he hasn't needed to get his heart restarted since his heart is fully fine. No more um, jacking up to, like I said, three, 400, um, his heart rate. Um, Jesus Christ. Yeah. So it literally every three to four weeks is getting his heart restarted in the in, in the emergency room. And they're just like, there's nothing we can do about it. And uh, yeah, fully fixed just just from altering his diet and changing his uh, electrolytes fully. So 
Do you think you'd um, go into a little bit more uh, specifics on that? Yeah, sure. So um, the four main electrolytes is kind of what controls um, our um, our heartbeat, but our, our everything in gen everything in general, like our muscles, uh, contraction, like. Um, calcium contraction, magnesium relaxation, sodium, potassium, they also control the rate at which, like example, your heart contracts and, uh, you know, one speeds it up, one slows it down. Those four main electrolytes are what gives us that, uh, you know, that right strength with the right amount of relaxation. So it doesn't just go whoosh, relax. And then uh, the speed of it too, right? We want that, you know, normal um, heart, heart rate um, amount. So yeah, um, his was jacked up. Generally, when I generally uh, cases like this, when if you see my blood pressure uh, fixes too, blood pressure and heart rate is almost generally a lack of uh, magnesium and then uh, a lack of potassium. Um, and you know, like most people's diet, they'll consume excess dairy, shit ton of calcium, um, and then an excess of sodium, which is you know whether you're using condiments or fast food or this or that. So literally, if they're not consuming dairy, do you see as much of an excess in calcium? Yeah, I, I, exactly. So. Uh, basically like for, for his instance, cause calcium is, uh, sorry, dairy's, uh, a cup of milk is like 300 milli over 300 milligrams of calcium, I think per cup. And you're not getting anywhere near that amount of, uh, calcium and like anything else in your diet, basically. So, um, we, we, uh, ditched all the dairy. We raised his magnesium. Usually when it's a serious case like this, I'll say like, Hey, we're going to take these supplements like, uh, magnesium, um, and potassium and vitamin E actually. So, Okay, I'll explain that one in a minute. But um, uh, yeah, so we upped the main electrolytes that helped uh, the heart slow down the contractions and then relax more, uh, which is magnesium and uh, potassium. Then the other thing with it, not a lot of people know this. I'm sure you've heard in like uh, the steroid fitness community about using aspirin, um, you know, natural protection, natural blood thin or whatever. The only reason you need that is because you have a lack of uh, vitamin E, actually. Vitamin E is your body's natural uh, blood thinner, basically. it uh, Vitamin K and vitamin E, they kind of go hand in hand. And if you add up almost anybody's diet, their vitamin E is complete shit. Like ni 99 times out of 100, they're not getting the RDA of vitamin E. So um, most people worried about, you know, oh, like, oh, yeah, take your aspirin. It's like, no, aspirin, you know, it has side effects in and of itself, like just get adequate vitamin e gotcha is a surplus of vitamin e is that truly suppressive of hypertrophy i've never seen any um um studies on that um maybe because are you referring to that it's uh like an antioxidant or stuff like that i i don't really know the specifics to be honest um i don't know if it's just because it is i i honestly yeah no, i i've, I've never seen uh, uh any uh studies to that actually so okay so what what did you guys do exactly to like adjust those macro or adjust those um, electrolytes? Was it primarily through diet or did you guys end up adding some supplementation as well? Like you said, maybe magnesium? Or? Yeah. So like I said, when it's like a serious case and you want to get something uh, um, quickly fixed, basically, that is when I will like uh, use uh, a, sometimes a high ass dose of like example, magnesium, potassium. We can't remember the exact dose. Magnesium, we're probably at like 2000 milligrams. That's normally what I do when somebody has like crazy blood pressure. Like if you see my other testimonials, I have dozens of high blood pressure cases, like 160, 170, et cetera, all fixed within a week, like in the 120s, 110, perfect. Wow. And so those cases too, I'll be like, okay, to initially get your levels down quickly, like literally within a week, we'll do like 2000 milligrams magnesium, potassium. We may supplement again, like 2000 ish milligrams um, and some vitamin E. And then after that week, or even during it, we start shifting the diet. And then after that, it's like, bam, let's come off the subs and let's uh, get more nutrients from the food. So like magnesium, one of my favorites is uh, seeds, sunflower seeds and uh, hemp seeds. Uh, and the potassium, plain and simple potatoes uh, and almost any vegetable. Obviously some vegetables like celery, there's not much potassium, but you know, you choose almost any other vegetable like broccoli and spinach, like you're getting a lot of potassium. Real quick, guys. So while I was looking at the YouTube analytics, I actually saw that 85% of you guys that watch this channel are not subscribed. And I want to ask very little of you guys, but if you enjoy this podcast, if you find value in it, then please do me this one favor and subscribe to the channel because doing so helps me get bigger and greater guests like the guests you are listening to today. Also, this channel is not sponsored. 
which means only the companies that I work with, which are Young Elaine and Huge Supplements, are the companies that can help fund this channel by you guys using the code Nile. So Code Nile gives you a discount of 15% off of Young LA, and Code Nile also gives you a, a discount of 10% off of Huge Supplements. And if you decide to purchase anything from any of these companies, it will help immensely for me by using my code. And this way, I can travel to other guests, such as Dr. Mike Israel next week, and also upgrade an equipment to make this podcast bigger and better for you guys. So of course this is gonna differ per person, but for him specifically and you guys working together, um, what did his diet look like beforehand and then what did it look like afterwards in terms of food choices? I cannot remember what his diet looked like beforehand. Um, Cause I, it, I think it was two years ago now, I think it was. Um, mm -hmm. I believe it was very typical like um, fast food here and there. And then the typical like bodybuilding uh, chicken and rice diet, which I always, if you've seen my posts, I hate on the chicken and rice diet a lot. Not be not not because of the um, lack of micronutrients. Yeah, exactly. You know, white rice is uh, uh it's dehusked, right? All the nutrients are in the bra in, in the husk. And then some some bodybuilders, when they go for the chicken and white rice, they'll like they'll say, Oh yeah, I eat my vegetables, but what that really means is I have like one cup of broccoli for like one meal and that's it, right? You know, so or they have like this much broccoli, this tiny half a cup or something like that. So yeah, that's why I uh I hate on it basically. Gotcha. So what does his diet look like afterwards? Oh man, I can't remember the exact details, but I know it's uh, but I know what I would prescribe for uh that issue. Um I get, I always ask what I, I always ask people is like, I was like, okay, what is your favorite vegetables? What are your favorite carbs, et cetera? Cause if somebody's like, no, I, I, I'm not, I'm not eating spinach. Some people be like, or I'm not eating broccoli. I'm not eating this. It'd be like, okay, what about potatoes? You know, one potato is like 1500, one large is like 1500 milligrams of potassium. So, um, yeah, I, I can't remember exactly. I, I should have looked that one up, um, for it. But yeah, I, what I would normally suggest, which I probably did suggest for him, would be most any meat, like a variety of meat, go ahead, eat all your meat, eat whatever meat. And then it would have been um, squash or potato focus over white rice. Um, and then it would have been a crap ton of seeds and basically any vegetable. So same with blood. When people with high blood pressure come to me, it's like, hey, eat all these vegetables. Hey, eat as much potato and squash at, you know, whatever fits in your diet. And it's like, there's no way you're not hitting like two times the RDA of your magnesium and potassium, um, eating a crap ton of seeds, potato squashes. Gotcha. Okay. That was quite a bit of fiber though, huh? The the other thing where you're going to say that, because I know it's in the fitness community, it's like, no, no, keep your fiber low because it'll back you up. And <laughs> is that what you were kind of referring to? Yeah, a little bit curious. One of the other biggest things I deal with is actually digestive issues in people. And, you know, so many bodybuilders are like, no, no, I need to eat a lot. I want to eat a lot. Um, I can't have too much fat or I can't have too much fiber. Or it backs me up. So, yeah, one of the biggest things um, I'm also known for is getting people's appetite actually to like an amazing level better than it's ever been before while also eating healthy. When somebody's having an issue with fiber or, or high fats or stuff like this, nine times out of 10, it is you eating foods that I hate saying this word, but don't agree with you, maybe due to your um, uh, uh, gut bacteria makeup or um, uh, other uh, digestive like health issues. So what I do, I start people on elimination diet with vegetables that generally agree with everyone. And it's like, hey, look, we just, you're eating now, um, I don't know, 40 grams of fiber and you're eating almost none before and you're doing fine. So it was just those um, specific FODMAPs or whatever in those other vegetables. And then you start narrowing down like, look, you have a specific issue with um, this group of vegetables and you don't actually with the others, but you've never separated them. So it's like, hey, you actually don't have an issue with fiber. You have an issue with um, food groups or certain FODMAPs or so on. Okay, I see. Makes sense. Yeah, uh, cruciferous vegetables still make me fucking fart my brains out, unfortunately. Try, if you haven't, um, just celery, as much celery as you want for a few days. Um, then after that, add cabbage and then see, hey, wait, um, again, cabbage might be an issue for you, but those two are my go-to ones where people are like, crap, I'm actually doing okay. Like, and then you notice, you know, the health benefits and stuff like that from actually getting in adequate vegetables. Nice. Okay, cool. Um, was he on, uh, uh, was he on gear? Jim Roberts? Um, so he, he, he was always, uh, like a typical user on and off. Right. So he always had this issue, whether he was on and off, um, you can't remember if he was on gear when he 
when he came to me, but I think as you see in like the testimonial, he he's been using gear uh, right afterwards and ever since and hundred percent fine, zero issue at all. Wow. That's crazy. That's awesome. Yeah. I can't imagine what that would be like uh, running gear on top of having that heart issue for, for a while. So honestly that you guys were able to fix it through diet. That's pretty fucking sick. I, I'm surprised that he used gear when he was having those issues too, but you, you don't, <laughs> I know you know what it's like the uh, most people's mindset though, right? Like that's the last thing I would, they would ever give up. Right? Like no matter what. <laughs> yeah. It's crazy, bro. But I get it too. Yeah. Um, all right. Uh, I am curious about this. I've talked about it with a lot of people. I first discussed it with, um, with, uh, what's his name with D trend and then discussed it with James and Vigor Steve, your famous only Deca only cycle. Honestly, did you look like you have an amazing head of hair? So whatever you're doing right now, are you, what are, what's your cycle right now? If you don't mind me asking or what are you doing right now? Okay, so I actually just started one about a, a week ago now, um, and it's a uh, 400 deca. Um, so I haven't used D ball in forever because um, I won't touch anything that'll mess with appetite. Because you know, if you you can't eat, you can't grow, right? Um, so this is the first time I've used uh, D ball in a very long time, um, and I started at 10 milligrams a day. And then I just bumped it up to uh, about three days ago to 25 milligrams a day. But I also switched to injectable D-ball from the oral because I am I have a new theory-ish on why orals actually affect that uh, digestion. So I'm, I'm playing around with that and it doesn't seem to be just bile. And I think I've kind of figured it out. Um, so yeah, th that is what I'm uh, doing right now. But yeah, if you see my old post, I haven't been serious with um, lifting and cycling. So I was very serious between like maybe ages of 17 to 20. And then ever, ever since then, um, I just semi lost my motivation. And so like throughout the past, like 15 years, almost I'll like, I'll run a cycle, a short one, like four to six weeks, make all my muscle memory back and gains back. And then I'll come off and not touch anything for like six months, even a year, basically. Um, and it's not because I want that time off in particular. It's just I lose my motivation for it, and I'm not and I don't and I'm not going to stay on. So um, yeah, so I cycle maybe once or twice a year, um, but I, I'm starting to change that and um, plan to basically just uh, get big, bigger, essentially for um, you know content. So um, I, I plan to change it. But yeah, but that's what I'm on right now. <laughs> Let's go getting big for content. <laughs> literally, literally. <laughs> um. What what do you think, uh, if you don't mind me asking, what is your uh, theory on the orals affecting digestion? <clears throat> okay, so I was going to say this one for like for a big video to release, but uh, I'm going to mention it here anyway. So as everybody, well, for like the past few years, I don't know, maybe like five or ten years, I don't, I don't know. Anyways, the whole uh, a bile thing came into play, right? People taking tutka, utka, um, you know, you, you take an oral almost all hormones do it when you have high estrogen. So even on testosterone, you can do it. And we know trend affects the liver and impairs bioflow. And same with all the orals, basically all the methylated orals. And whenever I've taken Tudka or Utka, it helps my digestion a little bit, but not a lot. I'd say like maybe 20% at best. And that's what I find most people notice. And they'll take Tudka and Utka and it's like, my appetite is still not, you know, that amazing. And so I actually stumbled across it by accident. I noticed in a lot of the, the literature, um, hypercalcemia was noted with um, a, a lot of, of, of the oral steroids. And I noticed I didn't, you, you can find it with the injectables, but not as often. And it's like every single oral steroid study I looked at, I, that kept coming up. And um, uh, what the, one of the main things of hypercalcemia, uh, if you even just Google this, hypercalcemia, nausea, hypercalcemia, heartburn, hypercalcemia, constipation, uh, lack of appetite, dehydration. So, um, oh, uh, hypercalcemia, uh, bile flow, Hyper, uh, high calcium levels pairs all those effects that people get with orals. And then I also paired it with, I noticed it'll be a lot of pros or just bodybuilders in general be like, no, I can take 100 milligrams Androl, my appetite's fine. Then there's other uh, pros and bodybuilders and the like that would be like, man, I can't even take 10 milligrams D-ball. My appetite's done. And I started kind of trying to look and, I, and I'm like, okay, this pro is known to have lots of whey and just there in general. And then like this pro sticks to his chicken, rice, and uh, a little bit of fruit and this and that. 
Um, like J- Jordan Peter's example, I-, I helped in his diet was literally all just, you know, your typical fish, rice and vegetables and stuff like that no dairy. And this guy could take insane orals. And he's like, my appetite is amazing. Always. Um, so yeah, I've been trialing on a few clients and now trialing it on myself with, uh, keeping my calcium low and then keeping the nutrients that kind of offset compete or direct calcium where it needs to go, like magnesium, uh, and, uh, a vitamin K1 and K2 and, because normally 10 milligrams D-ball would destroy my appetite. Now, um, like I said, I was on 10 milligrams, now 25, and my appetite has been amazing. Before, I take 10 milligrams, and I'm done. I'm just wow. completely done, and I've been um, I've been ravenous my hunger, basically. So, yeah. Damn, just from keeping your calcium lower? Calcium lower with uh, more K1, K2, and more magnesium, and all, all via diet. So, basically, more vegetables, and mm. um, yeah. So... Wow. I feel like K1 and K2 and magnesium always have like a multi-purpose for a lot of different benefits. Yeah. Uh, yeah. You're like, you know, K2 kind of caught on uh, a few years ago, you know, with the heart disease and stuff like this. I feel like I was one of the first proponents really pushing that on the GH15 forms. If you've seen that, uh, K1 is also important. People really don't realize that. They'd be like, oh, I'll just take my K2. It's like, no, no. K1 also has the same benefits and in a different way than uh, K2. So that's why vegetables are I'm a really big vegetable pusher, basically. Gotcha. So what was my question? Um, Is there a type of uh, magnesium that you prefer or does it differ per situation in terms of supplementation? Supplementation. So I don't ever suggest anybody to take um, supplements long term. But when we do need to get things in control quickly, uh, magnesium glycinate or bisglycinate, I like a lot because the the, the glycine and it has good benefits and it's uh, absorbed easily and it doesn't really cause digestive upset for most people. Um, but yeah, that is what I'll suggest only short term. Then um, yeah, after that, that's when you go strictly to diet just because this is what I tell people. If you're lacking one nutrient, whether it's magnesium or K1 or K2, you are like 99% likely lacking a dozen or two dozen, whatever other nutrients. And every single nu- micronutrient you take, it either competes or offsets another nutrient like um, access magnesium will uh, lower calcium too much. It'll lower when each electrolyte or mineral is too high. It actually lowers almost all of them. So when magnesium too high, it'll actually deplete potassium. It'll deplete sodium as well. And same with sodium. When sodium's too high, it'll deplete all the other ones. And it's a big balancing act. And you go and you're taking 400 plus whatever milligrams of one nutrient. It's like, hey, if you had a god of food, you would have got even if it was like a low potassium food you still would have got some which is better than none and no matter what with food it's hard to throw things out of balance versus supplement right you take high dose one supplement you can throw everything off Hmm. oh man this might be a obvious question but why do you never want to keep anyone on any supplements two reasons okay the one as i was saying uh you don't so minerals are pretty safe um but like i said you take one of them and if you're if you're lacking one nutrient you're like I said, you're guaranteed lacking a whole bunch of the others. So you're just going to keep throwing others off and you're never going to be completely healthy or in balance thinking, oh yeah, I'm going to take magnesium. I know I'm low on magnesium. It's like, hey, no, if you add your diet in an actual app like chronometer where it shows like all your micros, it's like, hey, you're actually low in 20 other vitamins. So why the hell are you focusing on this? Just focus on the food and it'll not only bring up your magnesium, but it'll bring up um, all the other micronutrients that you're all lacking too. Then the other thing with vitamins, um, I did a video on this vitamins increasing cancer risk. So synthetic vitamins, they're not the same as vitamins from food. Basically, there's so many studies on um, especially the B vitamins of increasing cancer risk or like prostate growth just from taking even a modest amount of these synthetic B vitamins. Yet studies taking a high amount of uh, like B12 folate from food decreases prostate cancer risk and other cancer risk. So. We very well know we very well know that the synthetic vitamins they mm-hmm. they're different than what you get from food and negative. Mm-hmm. Oh man, it's a good thing I'm having this podcast with you because now I realize I really need to up my vegetable servings yeah. per day. Been really good at eating my fruits and everything else, but sometimes it's just hard to get those greens in, bro. I don't, it, it's a chore for most people. I tell people to eat them like. Um, Eat it like it's a side to your meal in the sense of, so like the celery and cabbage, like I said, to start with, 
I find those aren't too bad because you can eat them raw and they're not too bad raw. I'll tell people like you cut off like a chunk of the cabin, just eat it like an apple. And same with the salary as you're cooking or I don't know, you're going to your car, you can be chewing on your salary and getting that, you know, <laughs> versus like most people don't want to sit there and eat their cup of cooked green beans. Right. But like, you know, while I'm cooking, it's like I'm already cooking. I might as well just chew down some vegetables. Right. Yeah. People are going to judge me for this, but whenever I forget my greens normally at the end of the day, I'm like, fuck, I forgot. And I just go into my fucking like, you know, those five pound boxes and just grab like a gigantic half. Just, <laughs> just fucking smush that shit down. Um, what are your thoughts on uh, greens powder? So um, probably better than taking nothing, but I don't like them for multiple reasons. One, um, no matter what, I find people get you know how we're talking about vegetables and digestive issues. Whenever anything is processed, so like even whey, for example, I'll find people can have um, milk and dairy and get maybe a moderate digestive effect. But when you have whey, people who are prone to digestive effects, that completely just destroys them. And same with the greens powders. Most people who have uh, digestive issues, I find when they take anything processed, I don't know if it's because of the, the, them heating it up for long periods to dehydrate it or whatever, um, that causes, so one, the digestive upset, and I don't know why. Two, a lot, a lot of the nutrients we're wanting to get from vegetables, because most people when they cook vegetables, I feel they only steam it or, you know, more lightly cooking methods. Um, a shit ton of the vitamins are very, very heat sensitive. Um, like most of B vitamins, um, on average from, they, like B1 and multiple of the other ones, just from even boiling alone, 50 to 90% of it is destroyed via cooking. And it's dependent on uh, the heat, the temperature and the duration. So when you're dehydrating something that is, you know, it takes them hours at uh even if it's like a medium low heat, that is hours of just destroying all the, one of the main reasons you're trying to, you're getting the vegetables for the micronutrients. So um, yeah, just, you're not you're not getting all the benefits and nowhere near mm, gotcha okay cool nice all right um so for the deca only cycle are you still running well i guess right now you told me you're doing 400 deca and 25 d-ball right yeah and you're doing injectable now for d-ball yeah i, I switched to d-ball to injectable because uh, I, I, I tried it once long ago and I didn't notice a difference on appetite. Um, and I thought I would give it a go again. Uh, yeah, before I compared oral to injectable and I didn't notice the appetite difference. And I should have waited longer to give just taking it orally to see that digestive effects, but I got impatient. So I switched to in, in injectable, but I have some clients doing just the oral just to see, you know, how they go with, like I said, you know, lesser calcium, more of the vegetables and mm -hmm. magnesium. Right. Do you know what your um what what the substrate what your oil is for the uh, D ball? Yeah, so um it's uh just MCT oil and three or four percent BA. Um, I'll I'll uh in a hypothetical situation I would make it myself if you know what I mean. Yeah. Um. So yeah, everything is uh just MCT and uh BA. So that way you know there's no like crappy Sullivan's in it. You know. Yeah. Yeah. And it, and it holds good the fifty milligrams a milliliter. Nice. Okay. Cool. That's pretty dope to hear that you're still doing the deco only cycle and everything's going well. Yeah. So most people like, uh, you know, when you had D trend, uh, D trend and stuff like that on there, you know, it, it became semi pop, you know, when I, I did the first interview with Tony huge and that's when it kind of took off and, you know, you'll, you'll still hear it like, you know, D trend heard it and, and he did it and stuff like that. And I think you said you did it too, right? Yeah. Yeah. Uh, but yeah, I, my, my, my Facebook group example, um, it's like, I don't know, 3000 or something members. Like, I, I, you know, I have a, a, a mod, a modest following. Um, and yeah, basically, uh, somebody did a poll recently to see who all does, uh, DECA only and stuff like that. And it was so basically the majority of the group still does DECA only and it's going on like 10 years now. So, um, yeah, myself and then, uh, Ooh. yeah, my, my following it's, um, uh, when most people end up do, here's what I say, people, because some people would be like, oh, I feel, I don't feel optimal or whatever. But the majority of people who do do it, they end up feeling better. But you could also say that, would you say, go ahead. Would you say it's the majority of people in your group or the majority of people in general? I would say the majority of people in general, because a lot of people just, but here's the thing I wanted to add to it. I feel the majority of people who come to me actually have issues to begin with. Um, in general slash using testosterone. So like um, they'll be getting libido issues, whether it's from the high estrogen or stuff, they'll acne, hair loss, and just all these different, and 
or, or mood effects. You know, uh, mood effects are a big thing with testosterone, especially with the estrogen creeping up. So majority of the people who come to me, they'd be like, man, I'm thinking I'm trying DECA only my mood or my libido or gyne or this or that. Then they go to DECA only. And um, I, I've actually been compiling lately all the like messages I get, whether it's uh, every few days or daily, whatever. I was going to start posting those people just being like, man, you know, I tried the DECA only thing. I feel so much better and this and that and this and that. The guys who feel like, like, I forget what issue you said you had. You can let me uh, know that in a second. But I feel the guys who do find on tests, when they go to DECA only, they'll be like, oh, I just feel a little off or this or that. So it's like, yeah, the like, look at you. I don't know if you take finasteride, but like you got hair. So it seems like you're not getting the typical test side effects possibly. So I, I do, unfortunately. Um, okay, so I'll go to that first. But my first, oh, fuck. What was I going to ask? All right, whatever. I uh, don't remember it. But anyways, yeah, so I actually do get the side effects of hair loss from tests, uh, especially obviously dose dependent. Um, but now, after I've decided to go back on tests, I am on minoxidil and finasteride and I microneedle and it's made a huge, huge difference for sure. Um, so that's the nicest part. The other the other difference is I also bleached my hair when I was taking like Mastron at one point. So that really just fucking destroyed my hair for some time. So I had to like really recover from that. Uh, so after d talked about it, I was thinking like, okay, I got to be real. The way that he talks about it is pretty damn appealing. Like fucking golden era bodybuilders, nice skin, nice hair. Sounds hella fucking aesthetic. Who wouldn't fucking want that, right? So I tried it out and... Um, I liked it for a bit and I definitely made some gains like and it was cool because the gains were dry like he was right like I got bigger and I looked drier all at the same time which was phenomenal um, but d- dude I don't really know what it was going on with me and I don't know why because I would get my blood work done I get my blood work done every month so I would see my estrogen prolactin were always in range as well but I kept losing my hair and I, uh, the decadic was really bad for me. Like the decadic was really bad for me, man. Like I just, my, my dick actually was numb. It was like literally, I like didn't have stimulation. Did you get your blood test while you're on it? And did you test your deca? Yeah. Okay. What, uh, and you were on zero testosterone, right? Or HRT? I was on zero testosterone. I was on D-ball. I was on deca and D-ball. Um, and then I think at some point I was worried about the D ball causing hair loss potentially. So I think I tried like a small dose of HCG instead of HCG. Yeah. For the estrogen. Cause I, I didn't have like estrogen patches or anything. So I was just like, might as well try that. A, a few things I want to add here because obviously I do see people get, uh, issues like that here and there. Absolutely. Um, one, I always tell people get your DECA tested. Uh, and if you can't get it tested, get your blood test done. So your blood results would have been skewed because you had the D ball in and then HCG because, you know, I know what to see when it's DECA only. When you have DECA only, your plaquen will be low most times, like around seven, maybe a little bit higher. But the D ball and HCG. Mine was low. Okay. I think my prolactin was like maybe 10 maximum. And what was your estrogen? Uh, it's I can actually find it. but Or if you remember, was it medium um, or a little bit high? Well, uh, I don't think it was high. I think it was medium at most. Could have been like low medium. Because if people don't get, this is one of the biggest things I see all the time. Uh, even Tony Huge, when I told him about the deck only, he went and did it. And uh, him and Trevor, I think we're getting sides, like gyno and this and that. And they end up getting their blood test. So DECA will show up as an easy way, one of the ways to tell, DECA shows up as testosterone on the uh, ELSA method and on the LCMS, it doesn't. So if you get the LCMS and your testosterone, you know, zero and the other one and your testosterone is high, that is one way to tell it's real. And then we know how high estrogen kind of goes up so we can tell. Uh, the hair loss thing, like, like say in my group, I've been doing this for like 10 years and, you know, thousands of people, nobody sees uh hair loss on deck and like i said i have so many guys where they'll be using well here here's here's the thing i didn't finish yep. um so finasteride i was on finasteride beforehand i stopped the finasteride maybe a week before i knew that i was going to cause a little bit of shedding um so a week of shedding started the d-ball kept going i think it was the i think uh, my hair wasn't like shedding too much but it still was and then it just kept shedding, bro. It just kept shedding until like, I think like 
Uh, it's in my notes, but I, I can't remember off the top of my head, but it's in my notes. But uh, I think like maybe six, eight weeks or something into the D-ball only cycle, I noticed my hair started to stop shedding. Okay. But it took like a good at least like six weeks. Gotcha. And I don't know why that is. But that, that part kind of freaked me out because I'm like, I don't have six weeks of hair loss to, <laughs> at the time. Yeah. I didn't fucking have that. So what I was also going to add to that, because um, many people don't know this, uh, the other thing is... Um, so Debo in the past, and this is set, okay. So most of users um, who end up going on DECA only, this is what I get like 99% of the time. The beetle or, or sex drive, sex, sexual function is about the same. They feel like, like a normal slash or like they were on test. And the other half of the users get an insane ravenous libido. That is what I noticed for actual true DECA only. Mm. So what I was going to say to you, uh, two big issues here, and I think you did them at different times. Debo a moderate amount of people, actually, uh, I'm one of them. Uh, my function, it goes to the shitter on D-ball. And a, I see that in a good moderate amount of people. And that is with, um, so maybe you've used D-ball before, maybe you used it with test and you didn't get the issue. But um, with, um, I'm not sure if you know this part, but the reason I don't suggest uh, test with DECA is because DECA increases aromatization of test, which all, which enhances uh, estrogen and then prolactin. So make, DECA makes testosterone a powerhouse of estrogen, basically. So when guys are running even a, a low dose of test or sometimes D-ball, they're now a powerhouse of, or they can be a powerhouse of estrogen and prolactin. Um, estrogen as well? Yeah. And the other, uh, the other thing. What about the? Okay, go ahead. I oh, actually keep going. I'll ask this afterwards. <laughs> um, HCG for me, like so many guys out there, they'd be, oh yeah, HCG boosts my drive. Um, if you even Google this, and I didn't uh, realize at first, but HCG destroys my function too. Like it's just makes things impossible for me to uh, to stay functioning, to stay erect, basically. Um, That's crazy. I think That's surprising. Yeah. Uh, and the other thing with it, again, but I think you added the HCG at the end. Um, and, uh, another thing most people don't know, HCG rapes your hair. Every single person, and because a large a, lo a large amount of my following is a uh, hair loss sufferer. So you know, guys that have used everything and they'll check their hair religiously, you know, they're like doing the pull test, shaking it, seeing how much you're losing and just, you know, studying like the baby hairs and uh, oh, the pull test. <laughs> <laughs> any small dose of even HCG is worse than like a gram of testosterone I found in myself and others. So, Jeez, yeah. So, a gram, what the fuck? so if you're hair loss prone, uh, HCG is going to be one thing you might want to like semi try and stay away from. Hmm. Um, that's very interesting. Uh, I, th I don't, I think, can't tell you why I'm different, but I think for me, uh, I'll like say like jumping on a gram of test without minoxidil for nasteride, absolute rate my hair. I've never done a gram of test without it, but I remember when I first started test, I was on like maybe 300 and, uh, that definitely raped my hair while I was with nothing. But what raped my hair more was definitely the DHTs like Mastron or, or, yeah, that shit was that shit was absolutely just fucking detrimental. But HCG has never caused me those issues, and I'm also someone that responds to HCG with like a higher sexual function. I definitely get hornier on HCG, which I thought would have been like expected since you know it's fucking giving you some better, more mobile and whatever sperm. And that's what I'll say. Uh, most of users get, but you'll notice if you go on the TRT forums, there's like that maybe 10 20 percent where it's like help guys my tier okay. my trt has been going great i added an hcg now i can't get hard and this and that and so there is a a, mo a modest uh group that definitely it's like yeah it's uh wretched for them damn dude this is why i'm enjoying talking to you man because a lot of people who like just want to jump on steroids don't realize just how complex it is because everybody reacts differently man yeah. so you could have any crazy different combinations of different reactions in one person versus another yeah, it's just nuts. Um, okay, interesting. Uh, so I'm trying to remember what else I wanted to ask you about DECA because there was a question I had earlier because we were discussing the Diabol and the ACG. You don't happen to know why I may have experienced the DECA dick on it because I, I have some, I also didn't tell you. So very recently, I'm on my bulking cycle now. First bulking cycle I feel like I've ever really done for my pro debut and um I decided to test something out because I didn't really have the best experiences with NPP before. Decided to add some NPP now, about half of what I'm taking test-wise. 
and uh i keep like in my head i'm like scared about like whether or not my dick feels a little bit more numb but to be honest like it's been pretty good it's been doing pretty well it seems just about the same so i'm curious why now that i'm on half the npp as test but i'm doing okay versus back when i was taking deck only and i wasn't so this is actually really interesting i haven't talked about this too much again i was going to do like a a big video on this um People will, I'm sure you've heard this term before, uh, test this test, right? Whether it's test prop or testing Nanthe, and the same with DECA, like just, you know, or Nandrolone. Nandrolone is Nandrolone. It's actually completely false. Um, so uh, the, the shorter the Easter, the more androgenic. Um, there's multiple different studies on this where, um, so, and they, they compare Nandrolone and testosterone as well. So, you know, whether it was NPP or testosterone propanate, way more androgenic on like the prostate in the, you know, the secondary, uh, uh, sex characteristic tissues. And, um, the, uh, longer the Easter, the more estrogenic it is. And it's funny because I've said this in the, in the past before I even came across these studies. I was like, NPP almost feels like trend without the side effects. It's way more harder. It's, uh, more fat loss. And like I said, it's more androgenic. And that's why, um, you know, the, the, the studies show that's why. So the big reason maybe you're feeling that is because the short Easter is more androgenic. I made a mistake. Um, when I said DECA only, I, I was taking NPP both times. So you did. I took NPP for my DECA only cycle because I was too worried about having long-term side effects. Gotcha. I would be able to jump off if I needed to. So yeah, NPP was both times. So it would have been the same. So it wouldn't have been the Easter, but anyways, it kind of got that issue, uh, the Easter difference out there. Um, so you never used test and, and deck or NPP in the past, you're saying? No, I never used NPP in the past. I think I, I did a very small, like I added DECA for a very small period of time, like sometime in the beginning when I first started injecting and I noticed I had, like, I think I felt a little bit of DECA dick, but um, yeah, I don't know. NPP, it feels okay now, but in, in the NPP only cycle, I was having libido issues so i'll go back to uh two points is that one so this one's very rare but again you're getting your blood test um so this is very rare but i do see it. i i see it sometimes uh some people are under aromatizers but again you got your estrogen checked it uh checked so sometimes when people are having this issue even on testosterone they under aromatize uh you just might be somebody that does better on uh higher estrogen as an example um the other factor is uh if gear is under doso um again I, I was using a canadian lab not too long ago um i stopped uh making my own i got lazy whatever and uh the deca was 60 milligrams a milliliter and it was labeled 250 so i was only on 120 milligrams Ooh. thinking i was on more so uh yeah the few issues with you i'd say maybe it was under dose until when you're on npp uh solo here's the other thing like i said the npp uh uh the shorter easters make less estrogen so but again, you got your blood test. So maybe the NPP, you had uh, too low estrogen because it was NPP. Maybe it could have been a little underdose or just one or the other. Or maybe you just do better on higher estrogen. Those would be my three main points. And like I said, I find all, you know, all of those are less common. But, you know, like even you feeling better on uh, the higher estrogen. But, you know, any of that uh, could be the case depending, you know, like you said, you got your blood test. So you'd have to rule out those other factors, but those would be the most likely situate uh, scenarios. Okay. Interesting. Cool. Hmm. Okay. Well, I, uh, I, I have in the past responded okay to lower estrogen, but to be honest, considering just how many different, how many, just how many people respond differently to things. And I wouldn't be surprised if the issue still was related to that in some sort of case. I remember James also, discussed with me that Derek told him that when you take Nandrolone with test, it almost amplifies your response to estrogen. Yeah. Um, it'll increase the re receptor sensitivity. Then on top of it, it increases aromatization, like the actual, um, aromatized enzyme. Okay. Uh, so yeah, it hits it kind of double fold. So that's why Whenever somebody comes to me, be like, "Hey, my, you know, my libido went to shit on um, Deca Plus test." I'm like, "We'll try it without the testosterone because that's that's generally what happens to most people. They try using it with tests, and it's just like, no, it's not good for most people." How can we account for the uh, increase in uh, receptor sensitivity? 
don't <laughs> don't use tests or use a lower dose test or um and or an ai because partly that is in fact due to like the higher your hormones go up whether it's estrogen or your testosterone that makes you know your test with any androgen you take it increases androgen receptor sensitivity and that's the same with estrogen so it's your estrogen is creeping up and that's a side effect basically of um, estrogen going up you become more sensitive to it too hmm, okay so if you were just getting a blood work check would you recommend just kind of aiming for a lower estrogen number than usual if than whatever makes you feel best best if you're going to use testosterone plus deca yeah Okay. But but deca solo gotcha. deca solo on its own or items that make little testosterone or low dose of tests etc. Then you know you know if you're not seeing the sides which most people most people don't it's generally only with tests I see this issue people who want to run like above TRT doses mm, and okay. and then even some with cool. TRT. Gotcha. Okay. So I believe you discussed this with me prior, but you mentioned that you may have a new procedure with TRT and tests being fully hair safe. Yeah. Um, without like. Drugs or topicals, hair loss drugs? Yeah, so uh, this uh, was a really well, one of the really big topics I wanted to discuss with you, and it's obviously going to help you a lot uh, as well. Um, so as I was explaining with the Easters, uh, the longer the Easter, the less androgenic it was. And um, as you know, DECA is hair safe, even though for your one instance, you know, but you came off an asteroid, so you had multiple things going on there. Um, so I've tested this in uh, multiple clients now. Um, they were on, you know, with their typical test, test ethanate, test sipinate, whatever, got them off that, got them onto an even longer Easter of testosterone, testosterone decanate, bam, hair loss fully stopped. And these are guys that don't use like finasteride or anything like that because, you know, they're scared of the side effects, whatever. And in the study, it literally showed those longer Easter's testosterone decanate. So they're testing it on the, on the typical like secondary, um, uh, uh, sex characteristic tissues, prostate, seminal vessels. It was equally as androgenic as a uh, nandrolone decanate. And so I, I seen that study, I was like, wait, you know, nandrolone is completely safe on the hair. And it's like, I'm going to start trialing this out. And uh, yeah, I've trialed it on a good dozen of people now and uh, even taking it back out and adding in their typical testosterone, bam, their hair starts, their hair starts shedding again, take it back out, give them a little bit, add in the testosterone decanate, bam, hair loss fully stops in a lot of these guys were at TRT doses and then we even increase it. Uh, a couple of them did a cycle, bam, no hair loss at all. And I'm sure you as a hair loss sufferer, you're probably, you're probably like a uh, real anal with your hair. Like you can tell, like, you know what I mean? You like when you're shaking your hair, like you're like, you see those extra hairs and stuff like that. You know, when you're like in that good hair loss state where you're not losing any. And uh, yeah, this is, and that's all my guys. They know if they take a little bit of t-ball a little bit of this like no they're five milligrams anivar bam hair loss these guys know hair loss you know they're anal like us and uh so just like the study testosterone the testosterone longer easter testosterone decanate one million percent been hair safe so so you said the longer easters or just the decanate uh the the longer easters in general so it is literally and like i said they tested on uh uh nandrolone too uh the longer the easter uh yeah the longer the easter the more it just kept going downwards uh, on um, its androgenic activity on the androgenic uh, tissue. So, hmm. what what are can you give me a list of these long easters that you would suggest? Uh, well, the only two I think you're going to find like readily ab available, um, you know, whether underground labs is going to be Decanate or uh, the uh, un uh, undecal. I can't. I don't know if that's pronounced it, the undecanate or <laughs> undecalinate. I don't know. Those two ones. Yeah. Those are the only two ones you're gonna find. But they tested a bunch of other ones I've never even heard of. Like there was like like ten or fifteen different easters, and it just went from like shortest to longest. And it's like, okay, that's a lot of easters. But yeah, wow. why don't why don't people use that? Why don't HRT companies use that? Well, one. Um, so I feel it, it's like most things. So DECA has been used as, uh, uh, as I'm going to use this as a, a example. Uh, DECA has been used as HRT before, uh, for, for decades. And it was namely used as HRT in uh, HIV AIDS patients. And it's funny comparing DECA to testosterone as an example. Uh, the DECA group noticed improved quality of life, improved mood, and all these things, uh, better than testosterone. Wait, wait. Sorry, which one, the DECA? Yeah, DECA compared to testosterone. It noticed all these amazing benefits compared to tes the testosterone group. So that is an example of a... Improved quality of life. Yeah. Life. yeah. 
What what were like the controls of this study? Uh, so they did uh, they did a testosterone group and a, and a DECA group. I think both at 100 milligrams or 150. I, I don't remember. Um, yeah, and they I can't remember everything they measured. The, the studies you can find the study easily. Just search uh, HIV, nandrolone, and decanate. HRT, testosterone, and the study should come up. So yeah, they compared a whole bunch of different values in the deck. It was like, win, 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 win. And it's just funny that, so we have a study comparing it directly to testosterone TRT, yet DECA HRT isn't uh, talked about, you know, it's better on prostate, it's better on so many functions, yet it's not used like near at all. Very rarely a doctor will prescribe uh, DECA's HRT. So it's just, it's kind of like this, uh, the doctors, they don't care about you getting your hair loss or your acne or gyne or this or that. It's just like, hey, testosterone works and that is your normal hormone that you have. So that's what we've used for years. We're just going to toss this at you, right? The only time they'll consider something else is when it's something serious. And that's like most cases, like if you have prostate cancer or, or you know, um, prostate growth, then it's like, hey, maybe we'll try an alternative HRT. So it's like, I think that's why they, they don't do it because it's like, uh, testosterone TRT works. You know what I mean? Oh, you're getting hair loss. Who cares? Like suck it up. Like there's no need to switch it up. So I think that's why you don't see things, you know, changed. Okay. What about, um, what about the potential neurotoxicity of uh DECA? Mm-hmm. So, well, um, sorry, I kind of went off top there comparing the, the DECA with that. Um, when I, I was just using that comparison as um, why don't they use the testosterone decanate as um, as uh, HRT? It's the same reason they don't right. use uh, DECA as that. So I did a big post on this. Um, I can't remember everything that was in that study. Um, basically, the, st- the study slash studies, I think there's two of them people refer to is complete and utter um, shit. I did a breakdown on my IG and I'm trying to remember everything the study tested. So first off... Um, is it is petri dish study um second uh one they just applied i'm pretty sure yeah they just applied the direct hormone i can't remember yeah this was the other thing i don't think they mentioned this in the study they didn't mention if they're applying testosterone or deca powder or if they were applying it in a, a vehicle like uh with solvents and stuff like this because who's to say if they use prepared testosterone and deca the deca didn't have all these uh, extra solvents that could have been causing uh, the damage in and of itself in the testosterone maybe didn't have those same solvents. The other thing thing that they left out. Um, so here's the other thing. Th- there's a graph in the study where. Um, so okay, the first dose they use. Let's say you translate it into okay. I- I'll make up some numbers here. The first dose they use would have been like testosterone at like imagine using one microgram a day in the DECA at one microgram a day. Again, at that dose, it showed in the Petri dish that DECA was more toxic. The second you got up to a normal, like or more higher, like normal dosages, they were literally like 5% different. So that throws it all out the window again. Um, third, there is actually a, a study in rats uh, showing the complete, op- I'm trying to remember these studies because it's a lot of them. It's been a while since the research, but you know, people always come to me, oh, what about the neurotoxicity? What about this? There was a study in rats that showed uh, basically all benefits uh, in that regards compared to the Petri dish study. So yeah, it's on my Instagram. Um, yeah, if people go on my Instagram, they'll see, I, I forget everything, but both the studies people try in a link, it is like the, the biggest bullshit ever, and they don't translate to uh, real-life circumstances. The other thing on top of it, people try and say, oh, estrogen and testosterone is neuroprotective, right? The second you go basically above HRT dosages, it's not anymore. That's well-proven in studies. It's well-proven in like the, what's the word, pharmacology or no. That, I, mm-hmm. Anyways, uh, once you go above those levels, it's not neuroprotective anymore. When the second testosterone is even moderate bit high and increases CA2 levels, that extra uh, uh, calcium levels is what causes cell death to everything. This is why all steroids into different degrees uh, degrees cause brain cell death, ju- just cell death in, uh, in general. Um, and again, that is from any androgen and even estrogen when it's a little bit high. So it's it, it li- none of it applies to basically us using above HRT dosages. Okay. So that was like a long ass rant on that. <laughs> no, no, it's very helpful. So what would you say to all of these people who anecdotally feel their best on testosterone, especially mood wise? 
when um, you're discussing this study that you said DECA seems to have checked off all the boxes in terms of like improvement in mood um, and I, don't know, I guess whatever other boxes that you were discussing. So this one is pretty easily explained with the fact of this. Um, how many people do you know in the general of everybody you know that's done steroids has used DECA solo versus testosterone base or testosterone solo. I'm, I'm sure you could do this. You admit 99% that you know are testosterone solo, testosterone base, and like 1% are DECA solo, right? Well, to, to be to completely honest with you, because I'm not, I'm not trying to disprove your things, because, dude, honestly, I think your work is amazing, and um, I'm sure, you know, I don't know everything. I, I know literally nothing, so this is all news to me. But I only know, I know one, two, three people personally who have done the DECA only, and after asking all three of them what their thoughts are, two of them, Steve and uh, James, both felt the same way that I did on DECA only and both preferred testosterone. And then Dietren seems to agree now. He seems to have, he seems to prefer testosterone now. Yeah. So that's, that's, that's all the anecdotal evidence I have, honestly. Everyone else, everything else I know, I just, I don't even... I don't add that into the control because I don't know them. So in, in your uh, experience, in your world, you have um, <clears throat> you have a small sample size where 100% was negative, essentially. And so this was going to be my uh, comparison here. Let's say, you know, 10,000 or 1,000 people, whether it's, you know, you just read forum posts, all these people, testosterone, testosterone base. And you know four and then maybe four others you've seen on forums, whatever, say, say this or that. Um, so here's one example. If you were... Uh, if you join my Facebook group, you'd go in there and see a few thousand members that were prior testosterone users, now DECA users, with 90-something percent preferring DECA to mood and all these effects. That would increase your sample size to, you know, oh, shit, 90% of the people I that I've heard or seen have used DECA solo actually feel better than testosterone. So with your small sample size... Or at least at least 90% of the people who don't react good to testosterone. Yeah. So... Right. It, it, so... That would change your sample size to, yeah, so you've had people that have tried both now in a large majority, and now you've seen that, hey, a large majority uh, did I did actually okay on testosterone. And so, because this is what I find too, like uh, I have, and this is why I'm saying that, so I can probably count on both hands amount of people because, you know, people will come to me and be like, man, I'm trying the deck only because I don't want to go back to testosterone because of hair loss or gyno, et cetera. I don't want to lose my hair, but I don't feel optimal whatever on DECA. So I, I get those. Uh, I think some people act like I uh, maybe act like that doesn't happen. I get those too. But it's that 90 plus percent I find do do better overall, just kind of like that study show. But the study, of course, where well, they just summarize it, right? Oh, uh, better quality of life. They didn't say what percentage, but overall, you know, DECA won. Um, so yeah, I would say the only issue is that because you know, you could flip a coin four times you might land on heads every time. It is such a small sample size. So um, uh, yeah, I would say the only issue with that is that, you know, you have that very small sample size. Um, and then kind of to follow up with that, what you asked is uh, why those reasons? Um, one, you have to rule out is the gear adequately dosed? Because if you're on 200 milligrams DECA HRT and you're really only on 50 milligrams as an underdose, you throw that out the window. The second, which I said is uh, more common, some people are severe under aromatizers. And if you are, you're going to have jack, really piss poor estrogen. And uh, then that makes, again, DECA a poor candidate for you. So those are the two biggest variables I find with people. But again, here's the one other part to add to it. People don't realize if you go on any HRT form or Google HRT form or TRT form, uh, libido loss, uh, mood issues, anxiety, depression. You will literally see thousands upon thousands of people who start at TRT or a test cycle get depression, anxiety, and all these nasty effects. So I think the issue with this is that because people are so used to testosterone and they think it causes no issues that people are blind and don't realize that there is a major majority of people who feel completely crappy on testosterone. They just didn't realize it because the only reason they're looking at it now is because the, the, there's people out there who have tried a different base and it didn't work for them. And that like small 10, 10, whatever people have like, uh, I don't want to say a loud voice, but it's like, oh yeah, I tried it and it didn't do well for me. And because it's something new versus like nobody out there is being like, hey, 
20% of men on TRT forums, you see the posts are depression, anxiety, mood issues, et cetera. So yeah, in my experience, uh, in the real world, besides the studies, I find there is more complaints of testosterone and mood, et cetera, than there is DECA. But I don't deny that just like people can feel off on testosterone, some, but a smaller minority do feel off on DECA. That is my summary. Okay, gotcha. Gotcha. I feel like uh, I would conclude, not that this is t- technically right, but I feel like I would conclude that, say, like, suppose hypothetically, like 20% of the people on testosterone do not feel great with it and then move to DECA. And then you find that maybe 90, maybe even 100% of those people feel great on DECA. But then the other 80% of people that feel great on testosterone that never even tried DECA, you don't know whether or not they'd feel good on DECA or not. Exactly. So it's kind of hard to tell, but for sure, just like anything else, um, just like we've seen, like, you know, everyone, everyone almost seems like a yes or no if they're to intense hair loss or not or whatever else whatever other side effects seems like this is one of those two so um if you don't mind me asking and moving on to this i remember you also discussing i mean you mentioned this a lot and i saw in the q a one of the people someone actually wanted to ask this too uh sazel sean wanted to ask you what's this safe compound he's talking about that he won't mention until he's on a podcast (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> the um uh the no shutdown item right yeah 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 I, I i don't i don't think i told you before the interview did i what it was no you didn't you just mentioned it <laughs> so it'll, it'll be a surprise to you uh so i guess i'll do a little re- recap of it for people who haven't seen the video i did a video mentioning that this is like a it's going to be a game changer how many especially younger dudes right younger dudes they want to get into it but they don't want to shut down because they're worried they'll never recover or all this or they just don't want to you know, they're just worried about being shut down and altering their hormones. There is a compound that I semi-recently discovered, com- zero shutdown at all. Um, it's a steroid, but technically it would be referred to as a SARM, but it's an actual steroid that you all know, every single one of you know, and it's known as one of the strongest one. It's literally one of the strongest steroids. Um, and it's actually was labeled as super toxic before. Oh, we don't touch it because it's toxic. And what's funny is people posted this all over online, how toxic this steroid is. Nobody ever posted a study. So I'm, I'm going to look for the studies to see how toxic it is. It is actually one of the safest ones ever made. They compared it to typical ones like Anavar. You know, Anavar is like, oh my God, it's so safe. Women and children, there's no side effects. Anavar, you know, liver and stuff like this, it's fine. Um, it was noted safer than Anavar, basically all parameters. Um, and it was even noted in the studies and you don't see this often, no hair loss because they were really testing it on women and children too, because they wanted this anabolic agent without the side effects. So even in the study, no hair loss. And I've tested it on my guys, no hair loss. And again, their hair loss suffers a check. Um, and it's one of the best looks I've ever seen of a steroid too. Um, Kevin Leroni was a favorite of it. And you know, nobody had that grainy hard look uh, that Kevin Leroni had, um, and if you guys check my Instagram, you'll see uh, the bald dude, the Viking looking dude. And he looks very grainy and hard. This like, this very specific grainy hard look. And uh, yeah, that steroid is actually Halo. So, um, f- oh my <laughs> God, bro. What? It's Halo. <laughs> the one that you... You gotta have to... You've probably never... Well, maybe you have, but most people never use it because it's like, it's toxic. It's toxic. I used it. You used it? <laughs> I used it. It was probably one of the first steroids I've wow. ever used. <laughs> So, uh, my story is that I never really wanted to take, I didn't, I never wanted to take steroids. I just remember that I loved bodybuilding. I loved all these top bodybuilders. I loved Rich Piana. I loved Z's. I loved everybody. I just followed everyone. I followed Kellen Vomager. I was just obsessed with bodybuilding. I wanted to be on the Olympia stage one day, except I just knew that I never wanted to take steroids and I was fucking so afraid of needles. So men's physique came out in 2013 and I was like, holy shit finally I have an opportunity to get on there because like these guys are obviously natty right but I mean back in the day honestly a few of them probably were right back in 2013 um obviously as I competed and by the time I got old enough to like get on stage and do those things it quickly changed so I was getting like 16th plus place at nationals like three times in a row um I was just never i was i was absolutely not even getting placed at at my national shows um and my coach kept trying to push things on me so he started off with like take these ais uh this will make you drier i was like i fucking don't know what these are but i'm so depressed i'll take it because he said it's not a steroid 
obviously crushed my estrogen, came in looking drier, fucking probably have uh, permanent bone issues or whatever else because of that. But um, then finally for like my last show, I ended up taking some pills. My friend asked me when I'm on and I'm like, so I'm on this, I'm on this estrogen blocker, I guess this AI. And then I'm on uh, halo and he goes to turns to me and he's like, bro, are you, you realize halo's a steroid, right? And I'm like, what? And he's just like, yeah, that's like fucking the most intense steroid ever. <laughs> and I'm like, well, I guess I'm going to go into this not nanny. So I went into my, uh, my most recent show in with 50 milligrams of Whitney and 10 milligrams of halo. Got my pro card. There you go. <laughs> yeah. Uh, that halo man. I fucking look grainy as shit. Right? That's for sure. So, yeah, that's, that's so funny. Um, was funny also to add to this uh the the liver part right every person's that i've been trialing on everybody's blood work their liver enzymes stayed the same which was healthy and normal and one guy's actually improved while it was on it too and not taking any liver supplements nothing so that's how literally like the study shows it's not toxic at all like so like all right like <laughs> just you know it's plain devil's advocate for everybody listening because all these people are going to be like what the fuck are you talking about right like, so what do you have to say about all these people that have experienced all these crazy side effects on Halo? Uh, that's the funny part. Halo, I'm not sure if, if you know this, um, it is expensive. Um, if you actually check, um, like, um, maybe I don't want to say this certain word or anything like that, but um, the suppliers of it, um, even when you get it in a certain form, it's very, very expensive, like very expensive. Uh, just like Anivar, An Anivar, especially in the past, you'd buy Anivar, which is expensive. You'd get D-Ball or Winnie and a really, really cheap compound. I feel like majority of people who got Halo, because Halo is like way more expensive than Anivar even, um, have not gotten real Halo. That is the only way to explain it because when you have, um, and I'm not referring to one study, by the way, the studies I looked up on Halo, like um, a shit ton, Okay. All the studies, completely safe. You know what's funny with it too? Do you know what the studies report compared to uh, multiple other uh, anabolics? Everybody improved uh, an improved uh, an improved mood effect, all of them. And all my guys that have had use it, same thing. They report this, an amazing well, well-being feeling. So every out, everybody out there reporting all these negative sides to Halo, it's like, I most guarantee just like a lot of people used to get fake Anivar, you got fake ass halo because it's expensive and the studies show the opposite and my guys that have all tested it on i i made sure it was a test it uh you know it's tested as legit none of these side effects that people report so you have science and then actual test it real world results and, and again science for like decades now god dude what the hell yeah um the game changer every single person out there that's like oh i don't want sides or shut down or hair loss here you go. Like you're, you're not even on technically, right? Like it's insane. You're not even on. Um, and, and they even did it for uh, six months, a year, a year and a half or two years, these studies. And it wasn't low dosage. It's either they did, they did, compared all, all different dosages in like the same studies too, and compared their LH, FSH, estrogen, all these factors. Everybody was the same. It, the other funny thing is actually the men's, uh, from start to finish, their uh, fertility actually improved the whole time. So, like, if you want to do steroids and get your wife pregnant, like, this is going to enhance your um, fertility. The only thing it did was while it was on it. I think they're f so, go ahead. Well, while while they were while they were on it, what? While they were on it, the testosterone did lower because that's what the body. So, when you take other A's, the bater the pituitary shuts down, right? And it shuts down all your hormones, LH, and then you have to restart that to restart everything else. The testosterone, because it detected androgens, that shut down, but the brain still made literally the exact same amount of LH and FH for the whole one year, two years, whatever. And the second they came off it, because, you know, Halo's in and out, the second they came off it, bam, testosterone went back up to normal. So testosterone, it's kind of like if you take insulin, you take insulin, it's like, oh, I got 10 IU in me. I don't need to make 10 IU. The second you stop insulin, you're making normal insulin. So the testosterone, uh, goes away as long as it's active and the second it's not active your testosterone and, and that's because nothing else is touched right lh and fsh and your pituitary was still pumping every second ready to boost you back up and again nothing else was touched estrogen exact same the whole time 
That's insane. Do you do you have any way to explain that? No, and even they couldn't explain it because it. Okay, I can maybe understand LH and FSH would be normal, but why would estrogen be normal? No, and no matter the dosage of it too. It, it, even they couldn't explain. It. They literally said it. They they said something along the lines of basically what I said of like it doesn't affect um any of these. Uh, you know, the gonotropin producing hormones, you know, the LHFSH and this, like, and it, it, they were shocked that it didn't affect estrogen either. They're like, it just doesn't have, have, and this is multiple studies. It's like, it doesn't affect estrogen and it is a temporary testosterone effect. Like, can't explain. And the thing I really like, like I was saying, is that there was a year and over a year long study. Like, that's concrete proof. Like, you know, like, you don't get better You're than a that. long study. Yeah. What, what is this study? What is it called? Um, I, I, it's, you gotta be, it, it's safe. Some, you want me to look for it right now or yeah, let's look for it right now. I think right that's now. important. That's pretty um, important. Okay. Where am I? It's either on my phone. I, dude, if I showed you my phone and my computer, like the, the bookmarks and tabs and stuff I have open, you'd be like, no, that's, that's the uh, insanity. <laughs> okay. Uh, what would it be, be saved under? Okay. Uh, well, that's not it. Um, here's the other thing. Most people will be able to find it easy actually too. If you, uh, spell, um, if you spell the name of it, what is it? Flexi is how you pronounce it. I think, um, if you spell the name of it, mm -hmm. if you literally just spell the name of it, um, you'll basically come across every study with it and, uh, you'll f end up finding them. Um, now I got to remember what the hell I saved this under. Um, or am I not spelling fluxymestrone, right? Fluxy or fluxy. Yeah, I do not know how to pronounce that. Uh, okay, so it might be on here. So it might be this one. I'm going to look at my phone because I only have one on the computer. I do most of my research on my phone now. Mm -hmm. So it might be the effects of fluxymestrone administration on testosterone function. Might be that one. Well, th this would be one of them because um, obviously I mo basically only have the one saved that um, we're do this. Oh, yeah. This actually might be it because this one was uh, 10, 20, or 30 milligrams. I just have the abstract up. Anybody want to see the full study, they can open it on Sci-Hub for free. Yeah, I think this one. Yeah, this is the one. Uh, plasma samples were. Oh, this is one of them because remember I said there was a few. Plasma samples were obtained for testosterone, L uh, estrogen, LH, FSH at biweekly intervals uh, before during and up to 12 okay this was the 12 week one 12 weeks oh no i think it might have been the year because they did it 12 weeks after the treatment so yeah that was a neat thing too they tested the shit out of them before during and after like you can't get better than testing 12 weeks after right like that is you know um yeah see reduced plasma testosterone levels were seen within 24 hours as i said it's because the body's detecting it it's like oh i have enough i'm gonna stop and went back up um uh, where am I going? Uh, changes in uh, uh, plasma estrogen, uh, LH. Uh, yeah, neither L LH, FSH. Uh, were short-term study, single dose, very poor results. Uh, were unaffected. The lady has a local. Yeah, so it was that. It, uh, it's proposed that uh, fluxymestrone has a local effect on the lady cells, which is not meditated by the uh, gonadotropins. So uh, yeah, this is one of the studies. So yeah. Um, yeah. Damn. Um, what, so what about the studies? Um, and are there any potential issues with the studies that are claiming or showing like the lack of, um, negative effect to your biomarkers for, uh, for halo, for halo, literally, like I said, um, I can't remember all of them off the top of my head. I'd have to pull up the studies. And again, anybody can find the halo studies cause it's, um, it's such a, the testing they do, you know on testosterone there might be a whole bunch of different mechanisms they test it with the halo they very much test it what bodybuilders want to see so every single study you're going to pull up is going to be studies on um side effects uh muscle growth and shutdown basically so every study when people when you google it you're just going to see those studies um like i said it was compared to anivar like liver and lipids and this and that and it was basically like this to summarize it's like this is the safest drug ever made essentially because 
like really sa- actually safer than Anavar yeah, in terms it, of it, that's why lipids because they were liver enzymes. Yeah, they were using it on uh, women and children specifically in uh, some of these side effect studies. And it's like, hey, we don't want these children and, and women to get side effects. So they're well, the women are much more prone, and we don't want um, you know kids. We don't want to damage their liver. We don't want to give them. Um, um, you know, hair loss and stuff like that, all those effects. And that it literally compared to Anavar is like, oh, no, this is way better. Um, it does this so much better. And yeah, overall, it's literally like, it's safer than Anavar was the conclusion, basically. And, you know, Anavar is like the safest. <laughs> well, except for. Do you remember what doses? Do you remember what doses they were using for Anavar and Halo? Um, Oh, that one was a graded dose uh, as well. I cannot remember exactly that studies, but all the studies basically vary from 10 to 60. No, actually, there were some that was like 2.5, et cetera. So yeah, 2.5 all the way to 60, all these studies. So the, the, a lot of them were really adequate dosages. And like I said, for good time frames. 10, like, wait, 10 to 60? Yeah, well, I first said 10 to 60 milligrams. And then I said, no, 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 there were some studies that were 2.5 and so on. I can't remember the Anavar one specifically, but it was different dosages. I just can't remember that exact range for that one. I think there's multiple compared to Anavar. I think there's two studies actually. All right. I'd love to hear what people have to say in the comments or if people have read these studies or if they do decide to read these studies because they definitely will after you mention them. I guarantee it's, it's going to be full of a bunch of uh, people wanting to like cope on it, right? Like they'll be like, no, there's no way this is possible. No way this is possible. And when I research something, I make sure I read like every study possible. Nobody, because you know how everybody said Halo was toxic for years, right? Nobody's yeah. ever posted a study. I've never seen a single person post a goddamn study, but we just accept it because everybody's saying it. I looked at all these studies and you know, in like training studies, would be like, this frequency is better. No, no, no. This frequency is better. This is different. And this is hardcore, just concrete where it's like study after study. Nope, safe, 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 safe. Like it's it's all the same conclusion, literally. Ah, oh, man, this is so interesting. I hope that this doesn't push anyone, especially who hasn't been on steroids, to start Halo. That's that would be the worst possible outcome. But 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 at least they're choosing the safe one. I guess you could say <laughs> <laughs> that is the one thing, Derek. <laughs> I man, it would be nice if Derek takes a look at this and maybe discusses this too i'd be interested to hear what he says or if he reads the studies okay cool well that's like that was definitely the least expected uh anabolic i thought you were going to say for sure my comments on it after i posted the video everybody's like it's dhb no it's transdermal dht no it's it's they're just saying all these they're saying all this shit and i'm like it's not i literally said it was hair safe i literally said no shutdown and they're listing all this stuff and then i just started agreeing with people i, I was sick of replying they're like it's mm-hmm. dhb i'm like okay it's dhb i just kept agreeing with them but um what what about the aggression what about aggression side effects so that's not noted in any studies but it's not to say just because it wasn't you know certain studies they they're not looking for everything like there's tons of testosterone studies where it's like uh sorry there isn't where it's like 50 percent of people got hair loss you don't see that because they're not looking for it. They're looking for, oh, what's the effect on prostate or this or that, right? So I've not came across any studies where it noted aggression. Doesn't mean it wouldn't happen. So it's one of those things where we have to look for what happens in the real world. And as I said, my guys that I tested it on, um, it was tested Halo and none of them reported aggression. So I think that's a false thing to further prove people who got side effects on Halo in the past probably got m trend or some other and um, some other dht because you know all the dhts are kind of like the aggression one so i think everybody getting aggression got uh, a dht drug um because my guys aren't seeing it and it's gotcha. not noted and it's not you know it's not a dht and that's kind of what dhts are known for it, it's uh it's from testosterone right it's like it's like uh t-ball and d-ball how long were you guys running a halo for um, so I'm not sure if you know, all my guys run uh, six week cycles. I'm not sure if you've seen that, the short cycle. So um, every person that I've had it uh, has done uh, six week cycles. That's even technically considerably long for Halo, huh? Well, uh, th- you, you you know how some people think like, yeah, just, you know, run your orals a short period of time. But for Halo, no. Like, I mean, it's, it's you know, it it's completely safe. But on top of that, you know, the 
oral toxicity profiles are really overblown on, you know, uh, most of the orals, not all, right? Like super Joel has liver failure cases, right? Like super Joel, certain ones like that are toxic, but the typical ones, like, you know, they're pretty safe. I probably want to say that maybe you mean like respectively safe compared to other anabolics versus completely safe. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, this is the one thing I think where some people get confused too. Um, a lot of the times I'll say, oh, this one doesn't have, uh, okay, I'll be on a topic and I'll be like, uh, no hair loss, no gyno, no acne. And I'll be like, oh, this one's fully safe. Still has the same, I'm not referring to the side effects you can avoid. Example, all steroids increase calcium uptake than CA2 levels. So all steroids will cause uh, cell death and then increase risk of heart disease. So that, that that's when you're not getting around. I mean, you can get around it taking external, um, you know, uh, items um, outside of the, uh, the drugs. But yeah, you know, when I refer to safe, I'm referring to like, yeah, you're not going to get hair loss or gyne or acne or, or stuff like that. So, um, yeah. Okay. And you haven't really seen very, even after six weeks, you haven't seen increases in their liver enzymes. No, like they all stayed the same and uh, one guy actually improved. Um, but again, like I said, the, the typical oils, again, excluding some like anadrol and even then anadrol is moderately Here's the thing, you know, there's studies at a 50, 100 milligrams, 150 for months on end. Those people still saw some liver effects, right? They were, most were more moderate, right? So it's like, um, you know, that's still not the, the thing you, you want to do, right? But, um, you know, I think the main orals are decent, moderately safe. You know what I mean? In that regards, um, the main few, like d especially, d is a very, 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 d and Halo are, and Anivar are very, very liver safe. But again, it's not, it's something like if you were to take it for years, uh, oh, an extremely long time, that is when you'd be like, hey, you know. Yeah. Gotcha. What dose were they taking, if you don't mind me asking? Uh, my clients? Yeah. Most were 40 to 60 milligrams, and a couple were 20 and 30. Yeah. Damn, bro. 40 to 60 milligrams. Well, oh, shit. I wanted to try uh, every everyone out on um, see the different effects, right? Like how much more yeah. fat loss, how much more muscle growth, how much more hardness and fullness and so on. Um, and so I like that range, most range for orals. Um, you probably haven't heur uh, heard this or seen this, but um, I took um, 200 to 300 milligrams D-ball a day for an extended period of time. And I got this idea. I'm not sure if you've ever seen this video or article. Um, P.D. Grimkowski, I think that's how you say his name, uh, the co-founder of Gold's Gym. He did a video years ago talking about how he used multiple bottles, bottles of Anivar and D-Ball a day. And I started researching this. And there's a doctor uh, from California who treated like a lot of pros and powerlifters. And back then in the 70s, he had uh, his highest dose he ever seen was a powerlifter coming to him that used seven bottles of D-Ball a day. And he said it was... A, a moderate amount he would see gym rats use upwards of a bottle of d-ball a day and so on <laughs> so that whole abuse thing back in the 70s it's just like today right you know how you have guys like boston lloyd who wanted to test the limits and then you have the other group where it's like no i realize more isn't better um and you know, either way you're going to get uh the same result so um yeah I, that's why those typical orals it's like apparently you know I, there's no studies on those insane doses right but we kind of know and see that those main couple orals are not as toxic as we thought, but certain ones absolutely are. Gotcha. I really do agree with the whole, like, more isn't technically better. I, I, I don't agree with less is better. I agree there's a safe spot. Yeah. There's, like, the optimal spot, right? Yeah. Same thing for, like, taking Adderall. I've talked about this before. It's like you take, too sm you take no Adderall, you take too small of Adderall than you need. It's not going to really help very much. You take way too much. It starts working against you, right? <laughs> You're tweaking. You can't focus. Yeah. So I feel like same thing for gear, but some people want to take five grams. Yeah. yeah. I, I did a video on that. I said, especially here's, here's my main point of view of it. If you're going to shut yourself down, run an adequate dose. Like if you're going to put yourself through that, you might as well run a dose that you're going to get some respectable result basically there's no point shutting yourself down like some people here talk about running 200 milligrams it's like you're shutting yourself down for something 
you know, everybody knows what 200 milligrams is going to get you. Are you going to get gains? Yes. But we even have studies on graded dosage, like more is better to a degree. It doesn't keep doubling, but that more is better to a degree. Um, so I hate when I see people say they're going to use 200 milligrams or so that. So I did a video. It's like, if you're going to shut yourself down, at least do like 400 milligrams. And I find that four to 600 is like that good medium ish dose. And then upwards, you know, a gram is like my. You said for like testosterone in terms of bodybuilding? For all the typical, like, you know, decade and testosterone are kind of comparable, right? Like dose wise for all those typical comparable ones. That's what I say that uh, 400 to 600 milligrams is like your, I wouldn't shut myself down for anything less. And that is like that me- medium dosage. I do want to discuss that. Uh, I do want to discuss though, like one person could react the same at 300 versus another at 600 of testosterone. People forget this all the time. Just the same thing as like TRT subscribe, you know, some people have TRT for 100 milligrams, some people are prescribed TRT for 200. And there's an actual really neat uh, a study I wanna add to this one. I wrote in my androgen receptor content, I did an article on this. They showed people, because we always know this in uh, a, a exercise, uh, a training study, some people see, you know, making up numbers, 10 pounds of muscle growth. Some people see two pounds of muscle growth. And they found that it didn't matter the serum hormone levels. Like the people who saw the amazing gains could have very little testosterone. And the people who saw shit gains could have high testosterone. Mm. And the difference to this was their androgen receptor expression. So same things. If I take 200 milligrams and my androgen receptors are just amazing, I'm going to explode. And if you have shit androgen receptor content and you take 600 milligrams, you're like, well, I don't, your androgen zone, I'm much too, uh, to work with, right? If you feel like any of the medications that we spoke about today may benefit you, such as BPC-157, GH acritagogues such as tessamorelin, IGF-1, oxandrolone charche, semaglutide, then you can obtain these from Trans and HRT, and the link for that will be in the bio. If you feel like you're experiencing symptoms of low testosterone, such as depression, anxiety, lack of motivation, as well as lack of sex drive, then you can get this checked out as well by getting your blood work done at Transcend, and they will provide you expert medical analysis. Transcend HRT has worked with many professional bodybuilders and pro athletes, such as Thor Bjornsson, Phil Heath, and Jeremy Buendia. And if you feel like this podcast has any relevancy to you, I do believe that this clinic will provide a great benefit to you as well. How do you, how do you think androgen receptors change over time and as a bodybuilder who's using? So, I, okay, I'll follow. Uh, uh, okay, so this is what I answer. So, I'm hated on for this uh, topic pretty highly. <laughs> uh, okay, so uh, every everybody says this. Every everybody posts the same studies. Look, you take anabolics, your androgen receptors increase. Everybody posts the same studies. Oh, look, this study shows uh, here we utilize AAs, androgen receptors increase. Um, nobody's ever posted. I've been the only person who posts this, and people try and argue, but they can never back it up. So um, I'm the only person that's found or isn't afraid to post because they don't prove what they were saying for years is wrong. You initially take AAs, androgen receptor sensitivity increases. Come a certain amount of time on, sensitivity decreases all the way down to baseline. I'm the only person that posted, I think there's only two studies of this where they actually tested day one to you know week eight or so on. Everybody else is posting the same studies and they'll post me videos. No, 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 this doctor, uh, here you go. Uh, androgens were taken, ARs increased. I'm like, literally read the study. It's the initiation of AAs. Let's test the androgen receptor content. It's increased. I'm like, show me th- show me anywhere in the studies that it shows week four, six, eight, week 12, any period besides initialation. Every single study these people post is that. And the only person that shows that literally, it goes down to baseline. And uh, so yeah, I did an article on this on my website. Um, and I post all these references. So one, there's uh, studies on Anavar, the way they did for 12 weeks. St- not just size, but strength and size, 90% was seen in the first six weeks. Then I post long easers with people like, oh, that's Anavar, it's a short easer. I, studies on DECA even too, which is a long easer. All the gains of people stopped gaining by week six and the studies went to week 12. There is endless studies that show that steroids stop working at week six. And you could say, oh, it's a uh, food intake. You're bigger. You need to eat more. Why would the strength then also basically plummet? If it's still having an effect on your CNS and stuff like that, the strength should still at least moderately go up. So real world uh, studies back it up. And then the only studies you have on receptor content, which we know is the be all end all of your gains, not your serum levels. 
increases, then it turns literally to baseline in six weeks. (laughs) I see why people hate you for this. (laughs) They hate me too also because they've preached it for years. No, no, no. Long cycles, long cycles. And then you can't refute that study. You just can't refute it. So if they agree with it, they admit that they've been preaching something wrong for the whole time. Here, I have two things to say about this. The first thing is I agree. I I feel there, it just, it would make more sense that um, initially they increase, but over time, I mean, just like with any drug you take, any drug you take, you know, you people forget that sort of tolerance over time. Right. And I mean, I think from, I think a lot of, a lot of bodybuilders can agree that they've had to increase their dosages over time. I think a lot of bodybuilders can agree that they seem to blow up the most when they first took their first shot of test or their first cycle. Yeah, right? Everybody says that, just, right? Right. So it just doesn't really make sense that you would become more responsive unless, unless, uh, you know, just being responsive in general doesn't, doesn't correlate in the same way people think to just your androgen receptive or your receptor sensitivity. So, and then the other, the second thing I would have to say is the six week cycle thing would definitely trigger a lot of people, uh, possibly potentially including me. <laughs> <laughs> I just think I, I, I understand where you're coming from there, but my surprise is like, how have all of these huge, pro bodybuilders become, you know, I guess gain their size and become successful by doing their like, you know, long ass bulking cycles, like running tests for that long. But you're shit. wrong. This is the big one. Um, I, I People always um, kind of ignore. This is the big one that uh, people don't realize is I'm OCD with my research and also OCD with researching um, what real world people do, like all the pros and stuff like this, right? And when pros say this, people want to say they're a liar. So hear me out on here. In my article, I listed a bunch of pros and uh, whenever I talk to people, I list a bunch more. Every single pro almost that I've encountered, do you know what they say? And most people, it kind of goes through one ear and out the other because they may, be, like I said, they think they're a lie or they hear what they do pre-contest. So I'm not in uh, argument and this is 100% what almost every single pro says they do. Pre-contest, 24, 20, 16 week cycles. They're not growing. They're on it and they stay on it because they need to preserve as much mass as possible, right? Every single pro talks about doing 24 week pre contest cycle. You further research into them, watch your videos or articles, and straight from the word of their mouth, almost all these pros say, Oh, yeah, in the off season, I'll do a couple bulk cycles of six to eight weeks. And every single time a pro comes out about it, and it's funny because why would you lie and say you only did six to eight weeks off season, but literally fully admit a second later, I do 24 weeks pre contest? Why wouldn't you just say both? Jay Cutler, he recently just admitted a cycle on Greg Doucette. He said he stays on all pre-contest. What do you say in the off-season? Eight weeks, test and DECA. Sean Ray, uh, same thing, six to eight weeks. Kevin Lavoni, in the, before when he stopped doing like the six month break, literally in articles, six to eight week bulking cycles. Dorian Yates, same thing, six to eight weeks of test, DECA, D-ball. Then he goes and stays on, uh, pre-contest. So eight. Six to eight weeks of the of the cycle, and then they drop to TRT, and then they go back in six to eight weeks. TRT, or they come off because you know, especially the o- older pros. Um, and I'm not saying this in a negative way because they did do things right. Um, a lot of them will say that, oh, I just I just came off, and then I waited a few weeks, and and you know, uh, how many weeks, and did my next bulky. I noticed a lot of them just said they came off, and they didn't feel any any different. They're like, I don't know if it was just me, but I just stopped, and I'd feel fine. And here's the other thing I think people forget, and this is. <laughs> What I do with my cycles is um, um, you, m- most everybody uses long users to, to bulk, right? Like testy, et cetera. They don't realize that when they stop and they're on, let's say, 500 to a gram or whatever they are on, they're not low hormones. The time it takes for that to reach HRT doses, like, you know, you can put it in a steroid plot graph calculators. Yeah, it could take forever. Four, six, eight weeks to reach HRT doses. And that HRT dose is still going. So it's like, they're technically still on the cr- on, on a cruise. And then, you know, by the time whatever it's really at that cruise dose, they go back on. And that's basically what I do with my guys as well. So it's like, yeah. So how, how does that whole like, how does that work with the whole, is it just because just you stop taking it? Just because it's not being input into your body. Now you're like resensitizing yourself. Like what, what, what exactly is I'm not sure the exact mechanism in the study obviously didn't either. 
all the study did was they gave people uh, test E, I think it was, uh, one of the studies. They gave them test E, then they tested the androgen receptor content beginning and and then they took it out for a period of time and then they retested it after a certain amount of weeks and found out when the receptors uh, were sensitive again, basically. Um, and so that's what I base it off of is a time frame of two weeks at basically HRT or a little bit under dosages. So, you know, if you're using DECA at 600 milligrams and let's say it takes three to four weeks to reach HRT and then you have that two weeks clearance. So a lot of my cycles will be like five weeks from your last injection till you can go back on. Okay, so you'd be doing like six weeks on, five weeks off? It, yeah, ish, it, ish depending, depending on the Easter, right? A, a lot of times too, I'll play with things where it'd be like, okay, let's say we're on a long Easter. We have three weeks of it clearing. Let's blast some orals or a short Easter so we can just whether, even though they stop working, uh, let's get some fat loss on like a high dose still as the deck is clearing, but we have three weeks where we can still whatever, have a high baseline with orals or tests prop if you're using tests or npp and then bam we drop it and we have uh two weeks of the deca fully clearing not you know lo really low wait what do you mean orals or test prop <clears throat> yeah so um let's say you do a six week cycle of, of deca right um you have deca up until six weeks here now you have three weeks of it lowering but your receptors aren't recovering because it needs to be down here and it's for three weeks coming down low so that's kind of wasted time you're not on the high dose of deca anymore and, it, and it's slowly lowering, lowering. So for those three weeks, you might as well hit that equalish dose or more, whatever you want to do of a uh, short Easter or orals for three weeks. So that way you stay here. And then as the DECA gets to the point you want it, bam, drop the orals, a test prop, and it's out of your system. And then you have your uh, two weeks of recovery. Okay. I see what you're Less saying. Less wasted time, essentially. Gotcha. Interesting. Interesting shit, bro. <laughs> Have you ever, uh, I know you had a podcast with Vigor Steve, but have you guys ever argued about this? Not argued. Um, I don't think we've ever, you know how I'm explaining it to you in depth. I don't think I've ever explained this to him. Um, I think we briefly talked about it, even on the podcast. And uh, he basically just said, um, he was like, oh, you know, you like short cycles. I, I like long cycles and that's it. Yeah. Type deal. Yeah. So. Damn. I, I want to hear you guys argue <laughs> about it. That's crazy. Yeah. All right. Well, maybe uh, sometime soon then. Yeah. So what are your thoughts on all of these? Like you've got a lot of unique proposed cycles and ideas. What are your thoughts on these for the purpose of like pro competition? Um, Obvious, obviously Halo would be pretty nice pro competition, but maybe the other things such as like doing a DECA only cycle or something like that. I feel like that might make a prep cycle a little difficult. So, um, okay. Two kind of two different ways to go about this one. Um, I tell people, let's say you're not a pro, okay? Um, it'd be, you just want to get as big as possible or maybe compete. I tell people, base your cycles off the side you want to avoid. Because at the end of the year, whether you use the grandma deca or grandma test, you're basically going to be the same size because it is mostly food and you just have an anabolic in you. So why would you suffer the acne, hair loss, and gyno and all that stuff if you're prone when you could have got the same result using one or the other, basically? So for most people, base it, base it off the side effects you want to avoid. Um However, so it's semi-genetic here too, because I have guys, if I showed you some pictures that are on like NPP or DECA, and as you notice, uh, DECA, uh, very little water retention. That's even proven in studies. People think it bloats you, but it doesn't. I have guys that look absolutely freaking amazing that use DECA or NPP only. And I think everybody can get there, but with extreme hard work and there is no denying, and I, I never deny this. I always say, hey, look, Test DHTs, those are all better fat loss, better for strength. They're better for so many other mechanisms, but for a lot, they come with size. So it's like for less genetically gifted people, you're going to have to put in more effort to maybe get as hard, lean, dry, whatever, going DECA solo. I do think for anyone, it can be accomplished, but it can be harder. But if you, it's not worth the hair loss, et cetera, to some people. But um, Halo is a big, big game changer because there's very, I did a, a, a video on this, all the steroids that uh, cause hair loss because, you know, there's no studies on this. So we have to test it on actual people with hair loss. The only ones I find that didn't cause hair loss was basically DECA, D-Ball, M-Tren, and now Halo. So um, we now- What, what? M-Tren? Yeah, M-Tren, which is, I feel another shocker to most people, but you know, as you make a drug an oral, completely different compound, right? Like uh, D-Ball is EQ, right? Uh, EQ is, uh, a D-Bolt is methylated EQ, 
completely different drug as soon as you methylate it. And that's the same thing with Amtran, completely different drug, no hair loss. So um, yeah, those are the only drugs that don't cause hair loss. And now that again, that we have Halo, which Amtran was a good hardener anyway. So I feel it's not a disadvantage with those two drugs because the main thing with competition is increased fat loss in the extra hardness that only stronger androgens provide and m trend and halo i feel that th that now that fits you know the need so um yeah and then also i guess somebody to follow up with a bulking don't really see an issue uh jordan peters i was helping there for a bit and uh he did deca solo but he did deca solo before he contacted me and he said the same thing he just felt it was a, a great side effect free um you know growing drug so to speak jordan peterson did deca solo yeah yeah <laughs> Yeah, you didn't. Uh, you didn't know that. <laughs> All right. So we talked about hair loss a lot, um, and we're kind of running out of time. But uh, uh, I would like to discuss maybe one of the most important things. What are some of the most important supplements and ancillaries that you recommend for maximum harm reduction from steroid use? Um, that, that's a big question to ask. <laughs> um, uh, yeah, it is. I know. Okay. Um, not the answer people want to hear, but um, diet. End of story. I've not seen better health marker improvements um, and then even enhancing gains uh, from diet. And one of the main things to essentially add to that, like I said before, and I feel like it's a cop out answer, but I'll explain in a second is your vegetables. People eat, especially today, uh, a shit ton of salt. Nothing wrong with salt. We need salt. And I'm a big pusher of salt. But salt, salt is 50 to 90% of the typical person's asset load in the body. Meat, your grains, aka rice, and uh, meat, grains, rice, and salt are the biggest asset loads. Um, if you look, if you look up the effects on this, like uh, higher intakes of meat, salt, serum pH, you'll find it puts everybody into a low grade metabolic acidosis. You Google the side effects of low grade metabolic acidosis. Immense. One of the biggest things is dehydration. No matter what, if your pH isn't optimal, you're not going to be in an optimal state of uh, hydration. Notorious different uh, health effects, whether it's kidneys, heart, liver, people in low-grade metabolic acid increases heart disease, heart failure, all that crap. The main only things that raises serum pH is bicarbonate, which you only get it in fruits and vegetables, and then your alkaline minerals, uh, potassium, magnesium, etc. So people want to take a whole bunch of subs or this or that, and it's like, no, you're no, you low grade metabolic acidosis, and this is serum pH, not your urine pH. Your urine is live. Your, your urine is always a little bit acidic. I'm talking about actual serum pH. Um, yeah, there, you are not going to overcome majority of uh health well not health effects but you're not going to be the most optimal health and the biggest benefit of health is literally vegetables and it's not just because of the uh uh low-grade metabolic acidosis and um bicarbonate and stuff like that it's all the anti all the antioxidants and all the phytochemical nutrients and all the stuff that we basically only get from vegetables and i'm not vegan by the way i don't pr promote vegan i promote a high ass meat diet lots of uh, salt and stuff like that but people fail by not getting in that adequate amounts of vegetables and I, literally i can't even understate the health markers and stuff like that i've seen improve with getting that and actually it's just very very little supplements because i like kidneys heart liver like all that even k2 k1 and k2 to prevent heart disease you can get all that from uh your your vegetables well k2 less so but uh k2 has the exact same benefits as i explained in studies and so on um uh and you get k2 from natto so um yeah i've not seen people's health markers improve by trying to take all these different uh supplements herbs or stuff like that more than when i've told people to eat a shit ton of vegetables so my supplement list that i suggest to people is basically like nil so that's my cop out answer. So you don't, you don't, even with all the vegetables and everything you're taking, assuming that they are on diet, you don't suggest that they take Tudka or anything like that or glutathione injections. Uh, none, like, like I was saying, I've never, even with people with Tudka, um, as we were kind of talking about appetite and digestion on oils, I've never seen people's uh, liver values improve more than uh, eating a shit ton of, uh, a shit ton and variety. Obviously, some vegetables can be better than others, like artichoke for the liver and uh, stuff like that. Um, but um, yeah, I've never seen a bigger improvement than um, vegetables. And the other thing to add to that, Tukka and Utka, long, long term, many people don't realize, can actually cause liver damage if you're on it too long. So many people be like, yeah, I want to be on this year round. No, no, no. It actually starts to harm your liver. Hmm. Right, wait. Um, can, you, can you state studies on that? Um, yeah. Uh, you want me to look for it right now? You don't happen to have it like 
on hand or i don't i don't think i have it saved um utka liver here's the thing most people if you know how to do good keywords you literally just type like lutka uh utka liver damage ncbi pubmed and you'll see it uh pop right up um Mm. yeah gotcha everything i say literally just google the keywords and you'll see it um you know obviously there's to be a whole bunch of studies you know uh this drug overdose or this or that oh it improved this what are your favorite vegetables so this is one of uh this is what i tell people um you know you have studies of different cultures and stuff like that like hey this culture lives along is the best health markers for this and that um the healthiest cultures on this planet we find eat the the biggest variety of foods and you'll see that you look up the composition whether it's uh you know like phytonutrients whatever or micronutrients they all have vast majority of different uh benefits and effects so literally what i tell people if most people don't want to do this because you know it's easy to just eat the same 10 foods over and over again but i literally tell people when you go into the grocery store this week you buy like these five vegetables and next week these five vegetables and you just keep mixing it up but um one of my probably top favorite ones it's probably cabbage um yeah if i'm suggest anybody eat anything it'd probably be cabbage one of the main reasons i see this if you go to my instagram you'll see a few posts down i did some uh posts on this um everybody tell to eat cabbage literally that day they're like this is better than any pre-workout the best pump i've ever had in my life Damn. um yeah go you, you try it. go ahead and get some cabbage uh today tomorrow whatever you're gonna be like holy sh-. you'll see my post on it you'll see a, a really big guy darren um literally i i recorded him because he was sending me messages so i screen recorded he's like holy fuck dude like i've never been so full and pumped in my life and every time he drops the cabbage he's like dude like i'm nowhere near as full and big and it'll make you full all day so um eat a, eat every vegetable possible but eat cabbage every day health effects and for bodybuilder you'll be full as hell just how much cabbage the more the better with every vegetable basically but generally what i tell people so they're actually going to eat it um i usually suggest about a palm size amount i'll cut it off in like a saucer about this ish big maybe half an inch or an inch big eat it just like a little a little puck and you just mount down like that and about that a couple times a day and uh definitely your with your pre-workout meal damn it's not too bad okay um for insulin, you suggested uh, more frequent injections for uh, less fat gain, more muscle gain, right? Yeah, I'm. I'm again. I'm doing all my big uh, talk. I haven't released uh, ha- like half of this stuff I talked with you about. Um, oh, really? You haven't released? I thought that I thought you had a big insulin article. Right? I have a big insulin article, but uh, some of the points I was discussing with you. This is like uh, my big stuff, so people are gonna get, especially like my followers, are gonna get. Uh, the, the some of the big info I've been uh I've been I've been hiding basically sort of oh damn so yeah um yeah I have a big instant article every pro like uh Jordan Peters a UK uh pro whatever you know what I mean uh he was one of the first pros I got to utilize it and he has a testimony on my website he's like this is the best instant article you know what I mean I ever read because I'm the only person that goes in depth on it like everybody will think all these myths about insulin, like insulin just increases appetite. I'm sure you've heard it's complete opposite. If you go, if you search Levomir, every single Levomir study causes weight loss and decreased appetite. Every single insulin binds to different uh, receptors like the brain or your muscle tissues at different strengths, um, as well as just different tissues in general. So all insulins are different. Some are more anabolic, some are not, some increase appetite. Um, so the key point that you're talking about there, I came across a really amazing study. Uh, they took rapid insulins and they either did a bullish shot, which example, let's say before a meal, I'm going to take 5, 10, 15, 20, whatever IU. And they did that in um, that group of people. Okay, well, they did that and then they did another group where they, I forget exactly how they dose it, but they split up that dose. Let's say it was 10 IU and they did 2 IU every hour or something like that. Don't quote me on it, uh, but it, it was basically like that. And the group that did the smaller frequent injection saw more muscle growth and actually saw fat loss versus the group that took the 10 IU at the meal and just at the meals saw less muscle growth growth and actually saw fat gain. So all these people there that would be like, oh, I gained a little fat on the insulin or this, that. It's because you're flat out uh, not using it uh, the most beneficial way. Um, so, yeah, that was uh, the really big topic. That is kind of a game changer. Just too. that they're using it like maybe what a couple times on their or like a few times on their big meals instead of like just distributed th- throughout the entire day uh, sorry r- repeat that cut out there the last part 
so they're they're essentially they're doing it distributed throughout the entire day versus how many times versus uh so the group that saw less muscle growth and saw fat gain they just uh they did just the meal so like 10 iu uh three times a day whatever and the other group like, three times okay yeah and then the other group don't quote me on it can't remember if it was like hour every two hours but it was that same dose but spread out um but yeah gotcha. and they literally saw more muscle growth and fat loss like no brainer there right what would you suggest for the uh type of insulin um so in my article i need to update it because i used to say lantus and humalog were the best ones but i've now changed that to uh lantus and apedra and you'll see most people talk about insulins oh this is better because it's more rapid or this or that that those effects almost nothing to do with muscle growth or anything in general uh different ones are just more anabolic and different uh, uh different better effects um lantus and apedra are the least side effect ones and the most anabolic ones. Uh, Lantus, of course, being your long really? acting. Yeah. And Apedra would be your uh, your rapid. Wow. Interesting. Is there any reason why you would recommend Apedra over Lantris or vice versa? So, um, y- y- yes and no. Uh, the best kind of case scenario is kind of using both of them. So your Lantus morning only, I don't suggest a broken up dosage just because Lantus it's kind of active over 16 hours. Um, and you using a nighttime one is giving you a spike during nighttime. Not a lot of people don't know this. So this is another big one people need to know is that insulin active without food actually makes you or low amount of nutrients actually makes you catabolic. It'll cause amino acid dumping and cause muscle wasting. So people doing the long acting late at night is uh is the terminal you just want lantis active during the day while you're eating so morning only for lantis um and then the side effect wise of why i was choose some ones over the other lantis seems to so one of the negatives not so much a negative it, it's a benefit we want potassium into the muscle because potassium is a big portion of uh muscle growth people eat more potassium have more muscle muscle growth Certain insulins can drop potassium more, shuttle more potassium than let's say sugar into the muscles. And when that happens, you get muscle weakness. Uh, you, you just feel weak. Your pump goes away and it's, you know, not, you're not going to get proper contractions of the muscle with your serum potassium low. Um, so yeah, um, a pedra. So when you go too high of a dose on Lantus, this can sometimes happen and you notice you actually look flatter. Everybody think insulin is just going to make you fuller. You go too high on Lantus, it'll cause dry skin, constipation, worsen your appetite and make you flatter. So Lantus, you want to... Because it drops potassium? Yeah. And you'll notice this in studies too. There'll be studies where uh, even just normal dosages of it will maybe a little bit too high for that person. Uh, th- the person was so weak, he w- was having trouble walking. And it's not hypoglycemia. People confuse that. They don't realize insulin can have other effects. This person's blood sugar was fine. That his potassium dropped too low. And they noticed that in the serum. And he was so weak. And I've noticed this too. And I couldn't figure out what it was. Like you go to work out and you're like, you're not to that extent, but it's just like, I'm not getting a proper contraction. Um so yeah, uh, Lantus can do that in too high of a dose. And Apedra seems to be the best overall with that and s- still the great gains. But Lantus is probably the most anabolic. Lantus at that right dosage in that normal range provides like the best fullness and the best gains, you'll notice. Gotcha. Okay, interesting. Would you have any recommendations for people in regards to avoiding the danger of insulin, especially maybe if they're going for something like Apedra that's a little faster acting? Um, yeah, first I'll state the, um, um, so I'm not sure if you know this, there's, there's a, uh, a suicide rate, um, no, a death rate study on attempted suicides for insulin. And the dosages varied all over hundreds of IUs. And these are people who weren't eating, right? Cause you know, I'm going to kill myself. I'm not going to eat. I know insulin will kill you if you don't eat only 1.8% achieve death. So this is a thing I tell people of people who intended to, to kill themselves. Yeah. So I tell people this, imagine you're a bodybuilder using a calculated dose, five, 10, whatever I you, and you're eating, you think you're going to be anywhere near achieving death when people were taking 300 plus I you not eating is like, I want to kill myself. And only 1.8% could, uh, could achieve that success. So, Basically, can you go hypo? Yes. Does that necessarily mean you're going to, you're in a hypo range that you're going to die? Very, very unrealistic. You have to, again, take hundreds of IU 
and not eat and be lucky that you're that one 1.8%. Um, so what I tell people for the dosage anyways is that people give like an IU. They'll be like, oh, 10 grams per IU or this or that. It's like, no, no, no. Everybody's sensitivity is different. What you want to do is measure your blood glucose and tiltrate your dose. Don't tiltrate your carbs. A lot of people do that. Tiltrate your dose up and down based off your blood glucose level. So let's say my normal meals, I'm using five IU and that's bringing me in my normal blood glucose range. So I, I stay there. If it's dipping me, I lower the dose. So base your dosage off your, your, your blood glucose levels. Mm, okay, cool. I, uh, I just want to say before this podcast ends that we are definitely not stating that everyone can take insulin and be safe. I do think people should still be very, very, very safe and probably avoid using drugs or PEDs altogether, especially if they're not. I just want to play, you know, place that disclaimer. But anyways, I appreciate for all the knowledge that you spewed today, man. That was a lot. That was a lot of information, a lot of new things, especially. And uh, I'm very grateful and thankful that um, you brought this up during our podcast. So, and I'm very grateful that we had this conversation all together. Yeah, I definitely uh, uh, appreciate you for having me on here. And it's, uh, it looks like we've been going for two hours. <laughs> yeah. yeah, definitely over time. Anyways, where can everybody find you? In Instagram, Facebook, all the typical social medias as uh, Tian Clark. Um, and then I have my website, which is uh, just my first name, www.taeian.com. Awesome. Thanks, bro. Thank you for coming on the podcast. That was awesome. Yeah, thanks for having me. Everybody, if you want to support the podcast, you guys already know. I say it all the time, but it really helps a lot. You can help us. The best non-cost way to help us is by rating us a five-star on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, or anywhere you find a podcast. And also subscribing to the YouTube channel and clicking that bell button because it helps us a lot and allows you to see the big and better guests that we will get like Tyan here. So if you guys um, want to watch more, hopefully maybe Tyan and I will do another episode someday in the future. Hopefully I'll get to like watch him argue with Steve on... <laughs> their their positions on cycle lengths and uh i'll catch you guys next time